Well, hi again, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Bobby Cochran. I'm with Oregon Consensus, and I'm here with uh, Sofia Castellanos, my colleague at Oregon Consensus. Sofia, can you say just a quick hi? Sure. Thank you, Bobby. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sofia Castellanos. I'm, I'm part of, of the Oregon Consensus team. Happy to have you, all of you, here this morning. Thank you. And so this is this is a really exciting day. Um, Oregon Consensus is the state's conflict resolution and collaboration service, and we're here working with Department of Land Conservation and, and Development. Um, Jeff, can you say a, a quick hi as our DLCD lead? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, you, for roundtable members, you've been receiving emails from me for a while here yet. Um, my name is Jeff Burright. I will be the coordinator for this roadmap development effort. Nice. And, and in a little bit, after we kind of get through some of our welcomes, you'll hear a lot more from Jeff, not just today, but over the course of the year. And then, Jeff, I'll just ask you to introduce the rest of your DLCD team a little bit later on after we get through a welcome. So that's OK. Um, so you probably are noticing it's a it's a big group of people today. Um, this is one of those days and those issues that's really important to Oregonians. Right? There's a lot that's happened. Um, getting to the, the point today. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that, right? We had uh, uh, a lease auction that was postponed. There's been lots of conversations around floating offshore wind over the last couple of years. But today is something different. This is the beginning of a process to develop Oregon's offshore wind energy roadmap. Um, a lot of you worked uh, to kind of advance stuff through the legislature. The legislature said, yes, this was important. The governor's office signed that. And now we're here today. Um, and today's also the first day of Native American Heritage Month. We were talking about Halloween and Diwali last night. Um, it's Dia de los Muertos. It's a time where we really are thinking about everyone that's come before us. And we think towards the future of where we can go. So as we're thinking about building the, the roadmap, one of the things that the DLCD team and Oregon Consensus really went back and forth on is we really wanted to lean into inclusion and openness in terms of process. And that's going to lead to big conversations because lots of people care about this. And we're going to need your help to make that, that work. So here today, uh, you actually have three groups of folks. There's the roundtable uh, members, and you'll see the little RTs in front of people's names. So that, that's that's the, the roundtable group. We also have the public. These meetings are wide open um, in terms of participation. We're inviting folks to, to be here, to listen, to observe. There'll be opportunities for public comment. And then we also have kind of ex officio members for the roundtable, which are all our state and federal agency folks. Um, and we've also invited our nine uh, uh, tribal uh, Oregon federally recognized tribes are sovereigns uh, here as, as well. So a couple of just ground rules for kind of operating today with, with such a big group. We ask that if you're a, a member of the, the public, um, you just save everything that you, you have till a little bit later. We'll have a public comment period. And Jeff, in about two minutes, I'll ask you to reflash that slide that's got the QR code. Um, and then also um, just be, keep the chat as clear as possible. We wanna try and avoid two parallel conversations if, if we can. Um, and then also we're, we are recording. So the recording is gonna be available. And the rule I always was taught is try not to say anything you don't want on the front page of the Oregonian the next day. Um, so, just be mindful of that. And then also, if you can be uh, thinking too around two basic rules that I like to operate by. One is um, the acronym WAIT, which for us extroverts in the room is why am I talking? You might be processing a whole bunch of stuff out loud, but as you're talking, other folks might not be able to talk. And for us introverts in the room, why am I not talking? I've worked enough in rural places that uh, a quiet room doesn't mean a happy room. Um, and as well, we really want to hear what you have to say. So um, let's see. I'm just going through my list of kind of opening opening things. And um, as we get questions, I'll I'll cue to Andy or others that are helping me watch watch chat. 
Uh, so for an example, there's a question uh, from, from Bill around elaborating on the round table. Jeff will do that here in just a little bit. So without further ado, uh, Karin, are you with us? I'm gonna turn it over to you for uh, a welcome from Governor Kotek's office. Karin is one of the natural resource advisors for Governor Kotek. Thanks, Bobby. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I have, uh, I'm not the only one here from our office too. Uh, Jessica is joining me and will continue to um, help support and facilitate this group um, in hand in hand with Bobby and Oregon Consensus and DLCD. But this group is really more than a year in the making. Uh, and I don't need to take up a lot of time because I know we'll be on for a couple of hours um, as we welcome the kickoff. But um, really want to appreciate the time and attention and thoughtfulness you each are bringing to this. Um, it is an enormously uh, talented and community-driven uh, group of individuals and just really look forward to working with you um, and helping to support these conversations going forward. So thanks for um, putting your name in the hat and thanks for the work ahead of us in the coming year. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate that. Jeff, are you able to share your your screen and then get me to that uh, second slide that's got the QR code? Perfect. Hui, how's that how's that screen look to you? Does it look pretty good? Looks great. Nice. So we've got a lot of different ways uh, for the public or roundtable members, anybody, to provide feedback into the process for the for the roadmap. Um, feel free to take your phone out and take a Take a quick snapshot and open this QR code up. It'll take you to a Google form. I'll go ahead and uh, Sophia, if you don't mind, could you drop the link for the Google form into, into chat? Either of those will take you to a form that you can submit public comments. Um, you can submit questions. You can submit anything that you're thinking about. We'll all get that back um, and we'll be able to respond to it over the, the course of our, our months together working on the roadmap. Google Forms not your jam, that's no problem. Um, so if, if you wouldn't mind just dropping the uh, the email in as well. You can just email uh, this DLCD at email and Jeff gets that all times of night, but he's not only gonna look at it during work hours, he promised. So lots of different ways to, to work together on that. Um, can you get me next to the agenda overview? Next slide. So today we've got a couple hours together. Uh, we're gonna be running nine to 12. If we have a ton of public comment, um, great. We'll go a little bit over, over 12. We'll just make sure everyone who's here who wants to get heard has a chance. Um, Karin, thank you for giving us uh, that welcome. I'm gonna turn it here to Jeff um, a little later to give us an overview on like what the roadmap is um, and then talk a little bit about how we want to work together, what to expect, um, and then we'll we'll close. Our next meeting is November 19th in Florence from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and so we'll give you some more details on, on that. So with that, Jeff and Ava, how we how we doing on getting ready for, for some breakouts? Um, I just need a couple more minutes. I'm almost there. Okay. No problem. So what we're gonna do here in just a, a little bit is part of with such a large group, we're gonna balance being in a big group together and getting feedback, you all listening, but then doing some breakout sessions for, for the round table members. So here in just a little bit, we'll send you to um, some breakout sessions um, and we'll ask you two questions. One, just to introduce yourself to your small group of other roundtable members. And then two, what does success look like? If you imagine that this group is presenting Oregon's roadmap to the legislature in June 2025, what, what's in there that you feel is really successful? What have we done together that says, yes, I feel really good about what we did? Um, and so we'll break out here and in, into into groups in just a second. We're also today, um, we're experimenting a lot today. Um, so just both let you know that and then ask for some some grace. 
um, this group and team got started really fairly quickly and has been scrambling to put together a really good process really fast with the resources that we have. Um, and to do some of that, we're going to try out new technology. Uh, we're going to experiment with in-person and uh, Zoom environments. There's a lot of things that we're going to try process-wise to lean into those two principles of openness and inclusion. Um, so just any anything you have relative to process improvements and other things too, that email to Google form, let us know and we'll we'll adapt as we go along. All right. How close are we, Ava and Andy? I think we're re we're ready. Um, I just would ask uh, would Jeff or or Bobby or Andy just take a look, make sure I did it correctly. If you just click on the breakout rooms, you should be able to see how everyone's assigned. Bobby, the, the one area I haven't succeeded yet in is on, in our advisory agencies. I have not um, kind of given them an RT underscore. So I think that's... Andy, I just suggested they put agency underscore to help you. Perfect. Yes. Thank you, and Lisa. I, and I think, Lisa and Andy, if you're okay, I'm going to go ahead and have the breakout groups open so the roundtable members can start introductions, and then we'll send agency folks there. Um, if that's okay. Yep. Um, and then for members of the of the public, you'll just uh, stay here with Andy and I, and we can we can chit chat um, about whatever we want to, and just and kind of hang tight while the roundtable members do that. So, Ava, let's go ahead and and open that up. Um, we only really have about 10, 15 minutes, and then I'll call you all back here. So just we're just getting started. And then for agency folks, um, if we haven't found you and renamed you, like for example, Bill Abity with US Army Corps of Engineers, you can feel free to rename yourself just agency underscore. Um, if, you're a, if you're a tribal member um, and we haven't found you yet, for example, Chief Barrett, uh, feel free to also just put, you know, you know, tribe underscore underneath, and then that way we can get you into a, a breakout. And then for members of the public or folks who would like to, to stick around, we're glad you're here. Um, just give us about, feel free to walk away for 10, 15 minutes or hang tight. Do you have an agenda for this meeting? Is there a posted? We we do. Um, yes. Let me put the link into chat for everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And Lexi, I'm noticing you've got an RT there. Have we not gotten you to a breakout room yet? And same with Scott. Is on. My interest in being here is, is to see to the extent to which we can have offshore wind as a part of the solution for the state of Oregon. And I'm so happy to be here. So Jeff, we've kind of- um, hey, buddy. Yeah. Did, did great. Did a good job of starting. Excellent. Um, I'm going to try to keep some notes as I hear what success looks like. But please don't let me stop you from introducing yourself to one another. So I did start off with the introduction. And then for su success, what success looks like to me for this process is if we come up with a clear process that is informed by the concerns of all the stakeholders, and those concerns are meaningful, um, that leads us to a series of offshore wind projects that will be integral in, to meet Oregon's needs for renewable energy. And to keep things going, I'm happy to jump in next. Um, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm Bill Gorham. Um, I'm a marine biologist, have been uh, involved in um, the assessment of offshore wind 
here since it really started in 2019. <laughs> Um, I'm also a retired environmental consultant and spent 30 years doing uh, large energy projects. So towards the end of my career, I was working in um, offshore oil projects, LNG projects. So I have a good sense of the federal process, the, um, the environmental review process. So from the standpoint of, from my standpoint, a success would be where we identify the key issues, the key resources, the key um, aspects of what projects would be and could be. And we develop or at least identify what are the right um, pieces of information that are validated, that are um, important to be part of the conversations. So accurate data for me is a very important part of this. I can uh, jump in next. Um, I'm Don Barlow. I am also a biologist. I'm, I work for Oregon State University, um, and my research is mostly on marine mammals and also a bit on seabirds. Um, so my my interest in coming to this roundtable discussion is sort of um, trying to understand what what information is out there that can help guide this offshore wind energy roadmap process. and. Um, what sort of knowledge gaps need filling to do this in a way that is um, that minimizes impacts and is, um, yeah, good for, as as good as we can do for both the ecosystem and the people in this in the in the communities that rely on these resources, um, and so in terms of what success might look like, I'll echo a fair bit of what Bill just said. It's, I think um, <clears throat> to me one thing I'd really like to see happen through this process is. Um, some some clear effort toward understanding what where the big no, biggest knowledge gaps are or where the biggest unknowns are, and a sort of prioritized plan to fill those gaps in knowledge with data to have a realistic understand excuse me understanding of risk. Yeah, and yeah, I'm looking forward to being part of this these conversations with such a an interesting and diverse mix of folks. So yeah, thanks for inviting me to be here. Floor is open. Good morning, Go everyone. I'm uh, Julie Seastrom. I'm Hannes Kuz. I'm tribal counsel for the Confederated Tribe for Kuz, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians. We've been um, involved with ongoing communication with BOEM, uh, specifically myself as the task force representative since fall 2021. And uh, they were working with them before that since uh, 2019 with uh, previous uh, council members. Uh, our concern is uh, that there hasn't been true consultation uh, in the, in the uh, process so far between Bohms and ourselves. And uh, we, um, our primary concern is that the questions that we've asked them have not been answered and our concerns have not been addressed um, as far as um, primary concern is the testing that should be done in the areas of concern off the Oregon coast for the um, ocean and lands that are um, related to our tribe as far as our history, our culture, and our practices. The testing is not going to be done by bone beforehand. Um, what they've told us is that it will be done by the lessees after the lessee is chosen. And we're concerned about that. Uh, as far as the accuracy of that information uh, and the implications that such a project would have on the areas that have been a part of our history since time immemorial. We were so concerned that we put out litigation um, stating this, and that's been out in the public for a while now. And that's part of why um, thankfully our governor also um, 
put out supportive words and a pause was put on their lease process, which they told us was going to happen for sure in October of this year. They told us that in February. And um, we work with them, work with them, work with them. And uh, finally, we got to a point where we ne we needed and we did submit litigation against them. And um, they put a pause on the situation. Um, different from your yourselves, um, everyone that so far that's spoken has spoken in, uh, as if this is like something that's a, a done deal and that we should move forward with in a positive way and, and and that kind of thing, and and I and I personally have grave concerns about that. Um, and so uh, I look forward to hearing as much as I can from all of you to uh, bring back information to our general membership that um, should it go forward that our concerns have been addressed. Well, thank you so much for inviting us. And I look forward to ongoing communication. This Thank is you, uh, Go ahead. This, this is Katrina Thompson. I'll jump in next. Um, she, she, Katrina Thompson. I'm the founder of Northwest American Indian Coalition, where we are a native-led intertribal nonprofit based in Brookings, Oregon, where one of the call areas are. Um, and success for us would uh, be that our natural and cultural resources are protected and that the tribe's sovereignties are, are upheld. Thank you. We, we have about a minute left. So if there's anyone, I see Dean, you on, on my screen, but just some, some quick, hi, who are you? What's success? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Dean Apostle, and I am a mostly retired landscape architect, uh, lives up in D Damascus, Oregon, and I threw my name in the hat uh, to be on this group uh, to help provide expertise on scenic um, resources and impacts to scenery. Uh, I've noted from the previous materials um, uh, from the prior groups that there didn't seem to be any discussion other than from the from the tribal groups uh, about scenic issues. And um, this is very concerning to me. Uh, I have worked on offshore wind on the East Coast and uh, so I have some expertise on assessing impacts of um, wind projects on scenic resources and hoping I can bring some of that expertise to the table and help people understand it so it doesn't uh, sneak up on the state later on, uh, which it will do if you don't address it at the front end. Um, so as far as what I hope for, it's it's really to get scenic resources on the table along with other resources to um, give it a fair shake and under understand what the impacts might be. Uh, this is Sarah Stevens. I'm with the Southwestern Oregon Workforce Investment Board, and uh, we've got about 30 seconds left, so I'll just say that one of the main things I'm curious about is how uh, we are building protections for all groups across the state in the communities that these impact most, make sure that those communities have the proper infrastructure, and of course that we've got uh, some really great plans of how we're going to build the workforce. Thank you. Is there anyone who has not yet had a chance to speak? I'm not able to see everyone here in my window. Did work. I see you. Thanks for that, Jeff. I see you first. Wait, can I pick on you and your group? What were some of the, sure, the concepts of success um, that you all talked about? And did you get a chance to use the Zoom whiteboard? Um, no, no time to use the whiteboard. I just took notes on the Word doc. OK. Um, so the themes are um, transparency um, of the process and uh, a, lot, a lot of different um, interests and groups and um, here represented and uh, we need to understand all the different sides of the issue and the scales of the issue. Um, 
what learning looks like, um, different ways of um, engaging people, different modes of engaging people, so we can have more transparency um, of the process. Um, see what else in my notes. Build common understanding, uh, find common grounds, share information, understand the challenges, um, and balance um, our interests. Thank you. How about for your group, Ava, and while you're coming off of mute, Andy, it seems like Gina Carter's team didn't have a, a moderator, so we'll just want to check check on that real quick. Go ahead, Eva. Thanks, Bobby. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of time to share, but um, some of the things we talked about uh, were that success next year will look like revealing a pathway to explore responsible offshore wind for the benefits of Oregonians and for future generations. Um, thank you. Um, how about for you, Lisa? What did your team come up with? Well, we didn't get through all of our introductions, so uh, just something to keep in mind when we meet again on the 19th that there needs to be a little bit more. Um, uh, we were agency heavy, and then we had uh, uh, Chief Barrett from the Confederated Tribes of the, of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslaw Indians, and then uh, from the Grand, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. Um, we, what, we, we, what we made through was uh, we wanted to, uh, the agency folks are there to research to make sure that we understand their processes and to be um, uh, here to respond to and learn from what it is we're doing. Uh, we were able to hear from uh, Chief Barrett and the concerns of ensuring that what we need to do first is fix our ecosystem and then how do we fit into that ecosystem is something we need to be really thoughtful about. Um, so that's that's where we made it through this part. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Sophia, how about for you? Thank you, Bobby. We just got to the introductions of each one of us in within the group. Uh, and I just share the link to for them to provide some feedback about the success of what they will see this process will be. So part of the introductions, everybody introduced uh, from which organization they are coming from and representing and more or less what they are expecting or how they would like to contribute to this process. So that was very brief, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, how about yours? Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Cynthia Smith. Um, well, I was by myself for a good number of that breakout session, um, but at the last maybe three minutes, I we we got a few people in there and we managed to give some brief introductions and um, we're, we were able to just get a little bit down on paper. Um, predictable, transparent process was um, similar to what Huey had mentioned, and then also understanding of our common ground and and hopefully coming to a compromise uh, so it's a win-win situation. Great, thank you. How about you, Jeff? So, yeah, um, our group just jumped right in, introducing one another and, and themselves. Um, some of the things that I heard were uh, an interest in coming up with a clear process, again, um, informed by the concerns of all the interested parties here, um, identifying key issues and resources, what our key data gaps are, accurate data was mentioned as an important piece, uh, and understanding how we're going to address our knowledge gaps. Uh, also uh, heard from Julie Seastrom uh, about the concerns that tribes have had about lack of true consultation and wanting to ensure that the questions that have been brought forward during the BOEM process have a path to be answered and that those concerns are answered. Uh, we heard about um, advancing the discussion about scenic issues so that that doesn't come later as a surprise in the process. And then also heard about um, how we are building protections as a state for how communities might be affected by a new industry, including both infrastructure needs as well as workforce. Great. And Gina, for for your your breakout, since you didn't have a, a moderator, 
Do you want to summarize a couple of the, the high points? Um, sure. Yeah, we did great introductions with each other and um, shared information a little bit about ourselves and our past. And then we got with the last two seconds, we got to what success might look like. So I'm going to hand it off to Scott because he had a great vision. Go for it, Scott. Thank you, Gina. Uh, well, we I was just getting started, and uh, as Gina said, we didn't really get a chance to flesh it out. But um, I thought uh, being able, being having a process where all sides could be heard, we could listen and learn from each other, and uh, then the time was up. So I didn't get a chance to build on that. Yeah, I think, and Ramfis, I'm hearing that too on on chat. You know. This is going to be a little bit of a tension that we're going to need your all's help kind of managing through. It's, there's like there's a lot of content. June 20, uh, 2025 is when the legislature has asked for kind of the final roadmap. And we don't have to solve the entire world's problems in the next few months. It's like it's, we're laying out the roadmap, right? Um, and that shared learning is so important with an issue this important and this complex. Um, so we're, we're just going to play with that and you'll see us try to ask questions, get initial feedback and provide a little bit more time for additional feedback ongoing way. DLC, you'll see DLCD hearing that and synthesizing that and say, hey, is this reflective of the little bits that you saw? And then try and build on all those nuggets into a snowball that leads to a roadmap. So Jeff, I think with that, you want to give us a little bit more on uh, what this crew can expect from us in terms of kind of the steps to build the roadmap, a little bit of context setting on what the roadmap is, who the roadmap roundtable is, all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, everybody, uh, I'm going to give about 10 or 15 minutes of introduction to what we're doing here and what we're going to be doing between now and June, as Bobby mentioned. Um, and then we hopefully we'll have some time for questions that you all have. Um, so I'd better get going. So I'm going to introduce you to myself. Uh, we're going to talk about the origin of this roadmap and its purpose and how it fits in the broader picture. And then I'm going to be talking about the roadmap roundtable, the development of the roadmap, which goes beyond just this roundtable, um, and how we're going to be building that together. Uh, first, just a little bit about myself and, and why I'm here. Um, I have a, a history and an interest in how people work together to manage risk and the things we don't know, and especially as it comes to new ideas on the ocean is something that's just been a fascination of mine for a lot of years. Um, I've been with the Oregon Coastal Management Program at DLCD for the last two and a half years or so. I have a master's in marine resource management where I studied collaborative permitting processes and how people manage uncertainty and risk. Um, and, and I lived on the ocean for a few years and I've actually built an offshore, a floating offshore wind turbine before and watched it slowly fall apart in the fall air. So. I don't know if that's the relevant experience, but it's there. Um, as I mentioned, I am part of the Oregon Coastal Management Program at DLCD, and there are a number of pieces to this program. One, um, we oversee the statewide planning goals related to the coast and the ocean, so both the onshore piece and the offshore, including policies contained within our Oregon Territorial Sea Plan that will come to bear if there are offshore wind projects. We also are responsible for the state's federal consistency authority. It's an ability to review state licenses and permits. And in my previous position, I was coordinating those reviews. And we're also a networked program in that while DLCD is administering the Oregon Coastal Management Program, we are a partnership that includes a total of 11 state agencies 33 cities and eight counties along the coast who all have policies that come to bear. Did want to just touch on a little bit of why. Why are we considering offshore wind at all? And what I've understood from talking to colleagues at Oregon Department of Energy and keeping tabs on this, what it comes down to is Oregon has an energy need in the coming years. 
there are projected growth of the demand for electricity coming from a lot of different reasons. Um, but that when you, you sum it all up, that by 2045, it's estimated that we need to be building across the U.S. West an additional 475 gigawatts on top of the 275 that encompasses what we have today. So there's an enormous growth need that has been recognized. And part of that need comes from this growing demand as we have population changes and usage changes, uh, as we are trying to decarbonize the energy we already use and convert that to more electricity. But then also as our world is changing and as extreme weather puts stresses on how we use power, that there is just a simple benefit in having more energy generation to help us keep stability. And so for all those reasons, offshore wind is in the conversation as a, an option that the state wants to consider. And here on the screen was a quote from Governor Kotek that I saw in the news uh, back just in September that I thought was really poignant and helped provide me some direction to say that you know, this is an opportunity. It is also a challenge, but we have to try. And so that's what we're here doing today. Uh, as I'm, I would guess all of you are aware, uh, there has been a process over the last four or five years uh, led by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to identify places in federal waters where it might be suitable to issue leases for the exploration of offshore wind development by companies who might then build them. And earlier this year, Baum did identify two wind energy areas, one off of Reedsport, Coos Bay area, and then one off of Brookings, where their intention was to issue leases uh, here this fall and, and winter. And when Baum uh, put forward that intention, that then triggered this federal consistency authority that I mentioned earlier which is a, an ability that is given to the states by a federal act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, that recognizes the actions taken by the federal government can have an effect on state coastal uses and resources. And so it gives the state this ability to review those actions against the policies that we have set for ourselves about the how we protect our coastal uses and resources. The types of effects that can trigger that kind of review are pretty broad in their nature, where they can be indirect or cumulative. And as you see on the bottom of the screen there, there are different categories of uses and resources that was recognized to be of concern and warranting this review. So what you see on the screen here is the, the rainbow chart that Boehm developed to show how their process works for leasing and then approving projects to exist out on the ocean. And what you see is those two big yellow areas, those, those arrows, that's where the state gets to come in and have a say. That first yellow arrow was the federal consistency review that we led this summer, uh, began in May, ended in July. And that was for the decision to issue leases, not to actually build something. And what that would have done if, if leases were moving, would have allowed companies to purchase the rights to develop something later and then go explore what they bought with the intention of developing applications for BOM to then review. And that would take us a, a period of up to five years, at which point the developers would submit a construction and operations plan to BOM. But before BOM could approve that plan, the state gets another opportunity to weigh in. So those are our two major touch points where we have a lot of leverage in addition to permits at the state and local level. But there was that whole process that was going on over these years and it was culminating this year. But I also wanna recognize that preceding this roadmap process that we're in today, there was an informal working group that uh, established itself in 2023, I believe. And I think any of you on the call today were a part of this conversation, trying to help 
build in some considerations and guideposts for the process that we're all a part of today. And I included that document in the meeting materials that I sent out to the roundtable group. And I hope that if you haven't read it already, that you will, because I think that is going to give us some good direction in the conversations that we're going to have. This roadmap is really led by House Bill 4080 in this legislative session which included some labor standards applicable to offshore wind projects and then directed DLCD to lead this offshore wind roadmap effort and to um, report back to the legislature actually by September of 2025. But we have funding for this engagement process through the end of the biennium in June. Uh, it also directed DLCD to evaluate those policies that I mentioned, those enforceable policies to look where we may have some gaps between the effects we're concerned about and whether there's a policy that covers those effects. And in the bill, they offered a series of topic areas that this roadmap effort needs to address um, and needs to specifically define standards to be considered in processes related to offshore wind development and approval. And you can see there on the screen but there's a, a broad spectrum of different interests that the standards must support. So we are in this dark blue roadmap development box right now. We're just beginning it. And the idea is that the roadmap itself is not creating policy. What the roadmap process is going to do is help us define a path forward. And that path could include identifying those gaps that we have in our policies and how we wanna fill them, which could include policy recommendations. We could also be identifying what the strategic challenges are and the opportunities if Oregon wants to pursue a path to development and then how to address those challenges um, and that it is led by broad engagement. Once a roadmap has been developed, then comes the implementation phase, which could also take a number of years where there could be formal public rulemaking processes to put into effect those recommendations that come from the roadmap, but that there also might be some strategic steps we can take, such as initiating some critical conversations that need to happen before the state is ready for an offshore wind presence. It could include things like having a research agenda, those things that we want to support to build our understanding and address the things we don't know. Um, it could include things like marine spatial planning or identifying investments that the state wants to make to, to bring down our amount of risk and to enable this to happen. And the idea is that all of that would happen before we see that second yellow arrow that I showed you where the state actually has the opportunity to review a project that has been proposed to be built. And once we have all of those pieces in place, once we've sharpened our tools as a state and have those critical conversations, our hope is that we're going to be in a much better position to know whether we're ready or not for this. What you see here on the screen is the, you know, finger paint version of what we're planning for this roadmap development process to look like. Along the top, you can see a consistent green bar that, in, that represents the tribal engagement that we are wanting to be participating in throughout this process to make sure that we are meeting our obligation to government, the government consultation, and to addressing tribal concerns related to offshore wind. Those yellow circles are where we are today, and that little yellow circle is today. The idea being that we're going to be having monthly day-long, you know, in-depth conversations about topic areas that we need to talk about with this round table. And that this is going to be a, a place where we can have those conversations. We may also break out into some working groups that meet virtually for shorter periods of time to take out some, some single serving topics, some things that we might be able to flesh out with some more focused conversation and bring back to the round table. DLCD is also going to be looking toward some focus group engagement to, to catch perspectives from people who aren't here today. And then we're also <laughs> going to do some public engagement events like public meetings 
And the plan is to have a public review of a roadmap document before we then submit it to the legislature. So again, up to eight monthly full day roundtable meetings between now and June. We're planning for six of those to be in person with hybrid options available. Those meetings we will make open to everyone uh, with recordings on YouTube. Uh, as I mentioned, there could be some working groups. Uh, we're going to have this email address that's open. So you could consider this a nine month public comment period, if you like, where you can ask questions, provide thoughts into this process. And then we are going to be providing meeting information to our roundtable members and posting it on our website ahead of these meetings. And as you've seen already this morning, we have established a Google form as well as a place where if you have questions or if you think of an information need that might help you participate in this process, if you have a great idea, send it to us in the off hours between our meetings. And that's what I have for you so far. So hopefully we have some time. We do. Great. Uh, to answer any questions that people have. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. Um, I know there was a lot of questions kind of happening um, already that I've, I've got some, but if you're a roundtable member and, and have kind of a question, either around process, what to expect or any kind of context setting for what the roadmap is or is not, um, feel free to to raise your raise your hand and I can I can call on you for those. Jeff, um, maybe one of the, the first up actually came from Charlie, um, whereas, you know, if Boehm kind of picked up the process of leasing again, like where where would they pick that up and how would the roadmap relate to that? Yes, thank you. So you'd have to break that into a couple of different parts. The state conducted a federal consistency review of a Bowen proposal to lease in the two identified wind energy areas. So we already had that bite of the apple, that left side yellow arrow. And we, we came out with a concurrence with conditions. What that means is a yes if decision, that the leasing may move forward, but that doesn't mean that a project may move forward. If there were, we had 19 different conditions that related to consultation processes, we wanted to see involvement of the state in the activities that are conducted in the surveys, as well as some pretty specific environmental protections that we would have expected people, that we, we do expect people to observe if they're going to be out there doing that work. So because we've already had that bite of the apple, my understanding is that if Boehm were to reinitiate leasing in those areas, they would not come back to the state for a re-review of that action, but Boehm would have to go back to the um, proposed sale notice step because that would then open it back up to competitive interest is, is my understanding, but I, I can't speak for Boehm in, in that regard. If there were to be um, a proposal to open new areas for leasing or to respond to an unsolicited lease request in some other area, that would reinitiate that first yellow arrow, that first state bite of the apple. Yeah. Rick, did that answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, as some folks know, there's a potential unsolicited bid pending out there and so my question was just going to be a follow up on, it sounds like this would start your process over. Well, that is a great question, Rick. And I would need to confirm this with the NOAA Office for Coastal Management before I could say for certain. My first blush, though, would be that if it was in the wind energy areas that we already reviewed, that there could be an argument that the effects of the action Boehm wants to take are not significantly different from those that were already reviewed by the state, and therefore it would not trigger a new federal consistency review. Yeah, Angela. Yeah, so my question that first bite at the apple, as you describe it, how much engagement or outreach consultation was was done towards tribes in that first process? Yeah, thank you. 
when we initiated our federal consistency review on April 30th, um, within a couple of days, we had sent notifications to tribes using our procedure that we developed over the last few years. We had a, a NOAA fellow come in and help us develop a tribal consultation and, and excuse me, a notification procedure. And so we sent out that notification. We invited that if staff wanted to meet with us in any capacity to talk about that proposal, that we were open to that. We also had a meeting. Um, we met independently with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. And then we also had a meeting um, on the coast with, I, I believe it was four tribes, if, if memory serves, maybe five. I think it was four. Um, to discuss our action and the policies that we were bringing to bear in the review and had had an open discussion about that. We also did host five public meetings, one virtual and four in person along the coast uh, in the month of June, opening up our decision and, and explaining the policies that we were bringing to bear, giving guidance on how the public could provide good comments that would that would help in our process. Uh, all as part of our review. So I, I saw a, a couple hands go up, and then uh, John Bragg. I saw you come off mute as well, so I, I see you. Um, and so I'm going to go Julia, and then John, and then then Joe. And I just as you all go to ask questions, I'd also just invite us to re remember that the roadmap is looking forward. There's the leasing processes and the other pieces that that Boehm had run through. Regardless of where that was going to go, the state decided the state wanted a roadmap uh, that could look across the entire coast, the entire stages, and look at various scenarios, scenarios where offshore wind does come to Oregon, scenarios where offshore wind does not come to Oregon, uh, scenarios where offshore wind starts in Oregon but then doesn't finish, or uh, and then supplies. There's a bunch of scenarios, and we're going to talk through those. I just want to remind us, because this is important to me, is is we're looking forward on what's important for Oregon um, and recognizing that what's important for Oregon in this issue is also important to folks across the Western United States, and the West Coast and nationally and globally in the context of climate change. And Julia and then John. I, I think my question will be quick and it's kind of logistical. Um, it's similar to what Lucy had put into the chat. Um, we have this like comment, like opportunity with like the, um, form and, and whatnot, we can communicate with you between meetings. Um, in my experience with public comments, it's like a really formal thing and you assess them. And at the end of a process, you share how you're going to respond to those comments. It feels to me, is that a little bit different this time? Like if we're sharing input about this process we're actively going through, are those comments going to be considered actively, you know, between meetings? Like, I'm, it's like, it doesn't sound like a kind of traditional comment period in the traditional sense of the word. So if you could be a little clearer about um, if we send you that kind of feedback, is that dynamically going to be responded to if we use those forms for that purpose? Thank you. Yeah. So I have a vision, silly as it may be, that this, this Google form is like the question box. And if you put a question into the question box, I'd like to have some time at meetings where we say, let's open the question box and let's see what people are curious about, what can help us through this process. Um, the, yeah. And I guess it's open for discussion and some further thought by us about how to address all of the feedback that may come in. But the the challenge and the task for DLCD is we're going to be accepting feedback from a lot of different avenues. The roundtable we're identifying is a central one, but we're also going to be talking with our state agency partners, talking with local communities, having these focus groups, having public meetings. There will be input coming in from many different places. And our task is to synthesize that to develop this path forward in the roadmap. And as much as I can daylight those things and bring them to the round table, that's, that's my intention. And, and Jeff, it's probably pretty fair to say this is not a traditional public comment process, right? This, this is way dynamic, right? And how we're going to deal with that is going to depend a little bit on where the flow of information is going. But what DLCD and Oregon Consensus have committed to is we're going to hear that 
get it synthesized, get it back into the round table in whatever form we can so that we can get that shared learning that you all said was important and we think agree. And then, at, but the role of the round table is advisory to DLCD. So there, there is the advisory piece. And But DLCD, the roadmap is not a decision to have wind or not. It's, it's the roadmap, right? So in that sense, it just makes sense to have things open, which lets us be adaptive and flexible and could be kind of chaotic, like today is a little chaotic and we'll figure it out together. Uh, John, oh, go ahead. I was, I was gonna go to John and Joe. Jeff. Yeah, I get, one last thing is we are thinking that once we have a roadmap document, we could have a formal public comment period on that and then that would give a more formal structure so which would be like late spring or springtime sometime yeah yeah john did we get your question answered okay we got you on on mute still there you are okay is that better yeah we got you thank you uh, you may have uh, at least uh touched upon it in your previous remarks but I was just curious in the documentation, I've seen a few tantalizing uh, clues about exit ramps. And yes. I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and describe how that process will work and where it fits into the, uh, into the round table. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that that will be an emergent quality of the discussion that we have. I think it was identified pretty clearly in the considerations document that I showed um, that's in your materials, that this concept of identifying those thresholds or those issues that might make us want to pause are, that that's an important part of making a responsible decision. And so I think that where I would like this conversation to go at some point is to tease that out, to understand what our thresholds are and what our decision rules might be for ourselves and figure out how those fit within the processes that we already have for making decision-making in the context of risk. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Jeff, I um, want to get a sense of as this process unfolds over the next, I guess, six or eight months, um, how will you incorporate kind of ongoing initiatives around offshore wind regardless of whether whatever happens so for example on opac there was a motion put forward in the june meeting last year that was a special meeting regarding offshore wind to direct the science and technical advisory committee stack of opac to kind of start pulling together relevant science um, knowledge gaps uh towards the offshore wind process and also to explore the development of an independent technical committee to provide perspective on Oregon and maybe even region-wide um, science um, vetting of this process. So that's a, the, the stack is supposed to provide a report to OPAC by next June, I think. So that's just one example. I'm sure there are other processes going on that yeah. will inform this uh, work group. And we need to be, this work group needs to kind of like be up to speed on that. So I wonder, if you can comment on that, like what's the process for that and, and making sure that information gets incorporated into this process. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of conversation to fit into not a lot of time, but I agree that trying to stay coordinated of the many different efforts that are out there is important to keeping this group informed. And I'll observe that in the conversations that I'm a part of, I'm hearing that there are a lot of different entities out there who are like willing and eager to be the center of gravity for the science, if you will. And I think that one thing that this group could do is try to figure out how we're going to have a game plan to work together on it. And, you know, we may come out with a research agenda over the next eight or nine months, or we may not. And we just may be kind of orchestrating how that's going to work for the state and that becomes part of implementation later because it, it might take more time than we have did, did that help yeah i guess just to just to elaborate a bit more just to clarify um you know i think the goal 
for like that OPAC science group is not so much like coming up with a research agenda. It's about making sure that as we move forward, if there is going to be a process again with BOEM, that it's totally transparent with BOEM and that communities in Oregon um, can have an independent way of vetting some of the work that BOEM is wanting to do. And I know that's tricky because we're the state and that's the federal, but you know, I, I you know I think there's been a lot of concern about some of the the uh, the science and uh, that Bohm has put out there, and uh, I, I think that's something that this group will want to make sure that we have a really good voice in Oregon to to influence what's happening in the federal process. And Joe and Jeff, one of the things I just want to reflect back that I really appreciated about that interaction between both of you is. Joe, you asked a question, Jeff gave an initial thought, and then Joe, you came back and provided a, a particular piece of a recommendation. It's like, hey, here's what I'm interested in, and then here's a way to go about it. I mean, that's gonna be perfect. Jeff and DLCD is wicked smart, and you all, it's the collective wisdom here that's really gonna make this roadmap together. So like those particular recommendations give other folks in the road uh, roadmap round table the ability to react to that. So that was, that was awesome. So thank you. Um, we're running on a little over at 10 o'clock. So Brees and Ashley, and then I think we're gonna try and wrap this up. That's okay, Jeff. So just kind of tight responses. But, yes. and, and also if I'm calling you out and I mess up your mispronounce your name, please let me, let me know right away. That way, I don't know if it's Brees or Bryce, but go ahead. Um, right the first time, it is Brees. Okay, uh, cool. Thank you. Um, I am, I have a suggestion, or maybe better phrased as a question, building on Joe's um, comment here. Um, how difficult is it in this system online to create a library of the, the pre-work that's been done elsewhere? I'm thinking of work um, that's been active off of Washington, Northern California, that may inform this. I'm, I'm all for the intelligence in the room, absolutely, but I often like to grade the homework myself. And <laughs> if we can create a space where we all have access to this and um, to these other examples, because we are crunched on time, um, so my ask is, can we create a, an online library, perhaps in a Google Doc that, or something to that form that we would have access to? Thank you. Great idea. Thank you. We'll take that back and see what we can build. Ashley? Hello. Um, yeah, my question is around um, just getting clarification on the public engagement opportunities throughout this process. So, um, so just to clarify, so folks can send emails um, throughout this process, as well as send out, uh, fill out that Google form, and that there would be a formal public comment period, or may be a formal public comment period when there's an actual draft on the form. Um, I guess my my uh, my other couple questions along with public engagement go. So, are the public welcome to come to every one of these roadmap meet uh, roundtable meetings? And um, and from my from my understanding that there would be meetings within the communities um, that community members may be able to attend to. Is that separate from this from this um, roadmap meetings that we're all scheduled to be at? And if so, is there an estimated timeline when those would occur? Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> no, those are all really great questions. Thank you. Uh, so again, with the, you know, when Bobby opened up at the top, this is a, we are leaning into inclusion. We are trying to provide as many opportunities as we can. I would agree with the ones that you said and, and emphasize as well, or I guess, confirm that we're planning to make all of these roadmap roundtable meetings open like they are today. That when we're in person, if people want to uh, attend as a member of the public, they may, um, and we'll have the hybrid option as well. 
We are having a public comment period as part of this meeting, and we're still building our agendas going out, but the intent is to you know, save, save time for that in those meetings as well. Um, there is the ability to email and provide, as, as you said, in the form, um, just to, to bring in feedback. And then the public engagement events, we have not yet fully scoped those out. There's more work to be doing on our end for community engagement piece. Uh, what I put on that chart of you know all the different shapes over time, a general idea that we'd have up to three public meetings that would be different from what we're doing here. Uh, maybe it would be redundant though if people are showing up to these meetings. Um, but just as an opportunity for us to, to poke our heads up and look around and tell people what we've done so far, take in some feedback that we can bring back to this round table. Did, did I get, did I get them all? Was there one I left? Okay. I think so. I think so. Um, yeah. And I think um, when there is an idea when those meetings may happen, um, I know like myself and probably other members of the roadmap group may want to, you know, do outreach and just make sure that folks that are not able to access these meetings because, you know, nine o'clock on a Friday is not accessible for working people that can't be on Zoom, for instance. But um, yeah, I'm definitely interested in making sure that community members can participate. So thank you. Thank you. And to that last point, this meeting will be on the DLCD YouTube once we work through our process on that. Um, so there will be opportunities for people to catch up. And I think, Jeff, it's also fair to say that you've built enough flexibility into the process design to be responsive to suggestions from the, the roundtable group. So, for example, there was a real interest in engaging um, the youth generation and their vision. There's a lot of the decisions this group may advise on. It's really our future generations that will live with it. Um, and so, but this space is just not a good space to engage with youth. So, we'll, we'll go and create different kinds of opportunities in different ways, but would love your advice on that. Bob, I'm gonna give you the last last one for a quick uh, quick question, and then I'm gonna move us on, if that's okay. Thank you, Bobby. It's it's not a question, just wanted to make a, a, a statement. Uh, we're all here today uh, through the hard efforts and work of the AFL, CIO, and TAN. Uh, House Bill 4080 was originally a labor standards bill for offshore wind work. And in working with the previous uh, uh, small committee on, on the road map, uh, they opened that bill up to insert uh, DLCD for this process. So I just want to make sure thanks is given where thanks is due. And Tan, thank you for your hard work. And uh, thank you for uh, getting that bill passed. And that allows us to be all here today. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. All right. Um, Sophia, I'm going to get ready to hand it over to uh, to you here in just a second to talk to us a little bit about um, kind of feedback on how we want to work together. So it builds off a lot of what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but just a couple logistical things. Jeff, I don't know if you caught, but um, as we go to breakout groups, if you could join group six, that'd be that'd be awesome. Um, Andy, I was noticing that a couple of folks may have left and and come back. Um, so like Karina um, or others, are you and Eva okay to send people to breakout groups? Do you need any any check in? I think we're good to send people, and then I'll be able to assign um, based upon who hasn't actually migrated over. That'll make it easier for me. So I okay. think we're ready when whenever you ask. Okay, and then for the moderators, before we go into the, the breakouts after Sophia gives us some context, um, if you can spend a little time to introduce folks to the Zoom whiteboard, that's a piece of technology I think we're gonna be continuing to use. So I'd love to at least test it out to see if that's the dumbest idea we've ever come up with or if it could work. Um, so just check that out if you could. Um, so Jeff, could you pull up the, the slides again for us? and advance it uh, to the, the spot on how we work together. And Sophia, it's floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bobby. And I think this part is links very well the conversation that we have been having so far. 
So as we look ahead to working together, uh, for us, it's important to take this moment to define how we as a group want to collaborate, right? So this part is about thinking and providing you some ideas about setting the tone, building trust, and fostering this environment where everybody, everyone feels heard and valued. So this is light. As you can see, poses this important question, how do we want to work together? And so let's think about the principles, the practices that will guide our interactions and ensure that our work remains inclusive, as we have just said before, productive, and is aligned with our shared goals. And your input will help us to create this collaborative culture that supports this open dialogue conversation and mutual respect as we move forward and creating and developing this roadmap. Next slide, please. Perfect. So at uh, Oregon Consensus, our mission is to facilitate this process uh, that balance advocacy and also collaboration. We like to encourage always our participants at the table to bring their needs, their interests, and also ideas at the table while reminded, committed, to working together. So this is a collabor collaborative approach that we like and often leads to outcomes that are stronger and also more effective than what any individual or small group could achieve alone. Um, there are a number of ways to advocate for your interests and in, in this collaborative space. So we suggest to be clear and specific about your goals, what do you want to achieve, what are your priorities. Uh, please be willing to listen to others because collaboration is always this two-way street, right? It is important to be open to hearing the perspective of others and understanding their interests as well. Um, please be willing to compromise. You may not get everything you want, but you should be able to reach out this level of compromise that meets everyone's needs as much as possible. Uh, be respectful of others. Uh, for us, uh, collaboration is about working together and the purpose is to achieve these common goals. And finally, uh, our role is to remain neutral as Oregon Consensus will be this impartial party here with all of you to, to facilitate the content of these conversations. We don't take sides on the issues we compromise with the integrity of this process, ensuring that this process is fair and transparent to all of us. Um, we are a resource for all the people at the table. So when you have any question or you have doubts about how this process is going, you can always come to Bobby and me to have uh, to resolve any questions or concerns because we are committed to the, this process to be fair. And we would like to build this trust that will allow us as a participants to focus on finding common grounds and, and continue supporting the LCD in this effort to develop the roadmap. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we would like to share with you what this round table is and what is uh, not. So First, as we just said before, uh, Bobby and Jeff share with all of you, the roundtable is an advisory body, not a decision-making entity. It makes recommendation, recommendations, as Bobby just highlighted how that could work. Uh, we, we will offer DLCD those valuable insights, input, feedback, uh, which DLCD then will use to inform the final decisions in developing the roadmap after considering all a lot, a lot of extensive input from all of you. Uh, the space, this space will act as a forum to discuss these various topics, assess potential opportunities and impacts and support the inclusion of all the communities that are here at this round table. Um, this also this roundtable is designed to foster collaboration and just uh, uh, share with all of you among all of us here and promote this shared learning, which is super important for these uh, inclusive conversations. However, it is also important to understand what this roundtable does not do, right? So it has no formal authority to make or enforce policies and it's not a sanctioning task force or an authoritative committee. This roundtable will not address any specific offshore wind proposals 
or engage directly with any future designated with energy areas. This participation in this body, the round table, does not imply support or opposition to the offshore wind development. Instead, it will serve as a collaborative space where these conversations, the dialogue, the exploration, and this inclusive conversation is, is going to be always encouraged. Um, and I will invite you to think about if there is anything else you think should be highlighted about what the roundtable is or it is not. And then we will have the opportunity to, as Bobby mentioned before, to enter our thoughts or how we would like to see this roundtable, what it is and what is not, um, um, in, in a final document, in a final draft that we will share back to all of you while we compile and synthesize your feedback. Um, next slide, please. Next one, thank you. So um, here, to continue with the idea how we work together today, um, along we know a little, but here together we, we can know a lot. So, we, I just wanted to highlight again some of the key principles that we would like to have and guide our, our conversation and how we work together. So first, as Bobby mentioned at the beginning, is the weight. Why am I talking or why I'm not talking? So this is just a reminder uh, to help us to stay mindful on when we speak and why and ensure that all our contributions are meaningful and with a purpose, right? So next, I would like to emphasize again, listening to learn. Uh, this means being very uh, and fully present and open to understand others' perspectives. Listening to the intent to learn, uh, this builds the trust and encourages this open conversation among all of us. And finally, let's assume uh, all of us, we have good intentions here, right? In others, while well, being aware of how our words might be received, so always be mindful of how the impact of our communication helps create this respectful and supportive environment. If there is any other principle or ideas that you think we should consider adding to how we work together, we can enter those in the Zoom whiteboard that we're going to work next. Uh, next slide, and I think I'm almost done. <laughs> so, uh, at Oregon Consensus, we would like to put together like a document, like a round table charter. And in this document, we will compile all the feedback that you all will provide us and we will have a final draft. And in this charter document, we it will serve mainly as a guiding framework for the things that we have said before as how we work together. It will outline some of the group's, group's purpose, the structure, the roles, the responsibilities, uh, to ensure that this is a transparent and collaborative exchange of ideas and we ensure this collaborative conversation throughout the process of developing this roadmap. Um, the charter document will serve as, as just, as just, just said, as a shared agreement, maybe, uh, with all of us setting the clear expectations to all of us of what is there, uh, trying to have this alignment among all the people that are participating as members in this roundtable. It will include the background or the context. It will clarify, as I said, the groups, uh, the round table purpose and the scope. And it will establish the role, the responsibilities and define uh, what is the group, the group is, and it is not, as just, uh, just shared with all of you. And it will also outline how decisions will be made. And we were talking and if it's needed to add there the timeline, the key deliverables, uh, other recommendations, and if we need to track the progress and how we are going to report back um, these conversations that we are going to have as our roundtable, it will everything will be aligned in this uh, charter document. Uh, next, please. And Sophia, we're we're running a little tight, so if we can wrap it up to <laughs> this is, yeah, just other elements for you to consider. If there are other elements, we need to um to think about that and how we should incorporate into this uh, charter to the collaborative work. So all ideas are welcome, and you will be able to add those in the Zoom whiteboard that we will be working on. And finally, if we find uh next next one, please. This is the last one, and. 
if we find something else that is important to define how we work together till June 2025, I will ask to all of you, if the members of the round table, if we can have two to three volunteers that could help us compile those ideas or this feedback or input into a final document that we can share back to all of you on November 19th. And that said, Bobby, please, uh, I think we can go next and join the breakout rooms and start working on the Zoom whiteboard. Thanks, Sophia. Well done. Um, I think we're uh, going to actually skip the, the breakouts and just kind of stay stay together. So apologies for that that flip, but we're just we're here together. So <clears throat> I think for any roundtable members and Mike, I, I see y'all calling you in just a second. Um, those two questions and Jeff, if you wouldn't mind resharing the, the slide, particularly about what the roundtable is or is not. Um, if you have thoughts on anything that we're missing in there that's important, feel free to just drop those in chat at the moment. Um, similarly on operating principles, in terms of how you like to work together as a group where you feel heard, you feel like um, there's an opportunity for shared learning and it's effective, uh, feel free to drop those operating principles uh, right on in chat and we'll, we'll gather those together and I'll, I'll summarize them here in a second. Um, and so if you want to watch those coming in, we can just flag them and, and talk about it. But Mike, what, what do you got? Uh, thanks very much. And I guess I, as I was listening to the presentation, it made me realize that um, the round table could be, could function one as a fountain of ideas uh, of various scenarios which is very, very different than a roadmap itself. And so the roadmap is this document. Uh, and as it relates to collaboration, um, the idea that if the roadmap, if the round table group just served as the fountain of ideas and its task was not necessarily to create the roadmap document that would incorporate that fountain of ideas, the, the nature of the collaboration that would happen amongst round table members would be very, very different than if the round table members were tasked with the idea of actually generating the roadmap document. And so I was seeking clarification to say, what is the task, of, what is the function of the round table? Is that principally as a, a way of generating the diversity of ideas that would be elements of a roadmap or is it to actually assemble the roadmap? Yeah, thanks for that question, Mike. Jeff, do you wanna take a, a run or do you want me to take a run at answering that question of, part of that is a function of how many people we're trying to engage. And that's it's a challenge of the fonts of ideas, the winnowing of the top end of the funnel towards a narrower set of options, then ultimately what gets in the, in the document. But Jeff, did you wanna talk about kind of the yeah. logic that you're thinking? Yeah, I guess I want to start by just recognizing that consensus has power. And if there are ideas that we discuss as a group where people are in agreement, that we pay attention to that. And if there are areas where we're discussing an effect and people are having different policy ideas for ways to address that effect, we we want to allow the opportunity for there to be responsible opposing views on a, on a subject that we can then bring into the roadmap and try to figure out, okay, how do we synthesize and manage that? But as Bobby mentioned, we because we have so many voices around the table and because there are so many topic areas that we could talk about in the time that we have, we are treating it as yes, a fountain of ideas and recommendations where we're gathering your values, your interests, the information needs that we ought to be considering as a state to put in that roadmap. But we are going to be checking for where is there a consensus? Where are there agreements so that we can really emphasize those? Bobby, what would you add or? Yeah, I, I think we're just gonna have to wait and see. I mean. Yeah. Because like with with twenty people, um, 
we would say, hey, let's try and get as close to consensus recommendations as possible with lots and lots of people over a short time with lots of topics. We're going to start as quickly as we can filling the top of the funnel and get it as narrow as we can. And we're going to have to trust our DLCD staffers to right. synthesize and see and present something back to us and say, yeah, that looked like you got it or no, you didn't. And then, and then get the best we can. And then like Jeff had mentioned, once the document is drafted, make sure we have one or two bites at that apple to make sure the document is as close as we can get it. Agreed. That's and those are two very very different roles. Um, and um, you know, I'm open to either. But this conversation is the first time it made me realize that the 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 interactions that would happen uh, amongst roundtable members will be very very different uh, if their assignment was to identify the issues uh, uh, as opposed to crafting the document that says, you know, a roadmap, again, is this neutral thing that just outlines, the, it's the map, it's not the navigation plan. Uh, and so creating that, that fountain of ideas or laying, mapping, the, mapping, laying the map down on the table uh, is one function, saying which path is a good path to take as a very, very different function. Yeah, you're right. I'll just say that our, our process, our process approach at this point is to just see how far we're going to get. And we're going to have DLCD holding the pen along the way, because that's just, that's the way it's going to be. Um, at least how we're designing it now. And we're going to trust them to be hyper responsive in real time. And right. And to the, to Julia's point here in chat, it's going to mean as process folks, we're going to have to be creative about different ways to get that engagement and negotiation right. and, and broad diversity. Because so, yeah. certainly the the statute calls on DLCD to to author this uh, author this. Thanks. Yeah. Other other thoughts on uh, kind of principles or what this group is or is not. Anyone really love kind of this process design stage and kind of scoping of charter and, and might be interested in, in kind of working with Sophia and I to write some of this stuff down. And then of course, we'd be checking that with, with DLCD. Julia, you raised your hand right when I asked for volunteers, but I'm, I'm guessing you might have a question. So I won't put you on the spot to volunteer. It's, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of okay. both. Um, the first thing is I, I was initially responding to what you, how you started that statement, which is um, how we're feeling about the process. And I just, um, I wanted to articulate that I really appreciate that we're leaning into what you mentioned might be chaotic at times, that this group is really large, that this is, that we're doing this in a way uh, that, that DLCD is trying to coordinate this in a way that is going to be as transparent and inclusive and able to integrate as many perspectives as possible and with this goal of um consensus when and where possible and and if not then like deep understanding of each other i think that's that's all feeling really good to me um i'm interested in volunteering but in no way do i feel like um if there is a high level of interest i would happily step back for other people to serve in that way so um that's it for me marcus Yeah, I, I realize that uh, these meetings aren't a place to um, agree or object with the project of offshore wind. However, I just I do have to say one thing kind of for my own conscience is that I can't find any estimates um, that say uh, that our country doesn't waste more than half the energy we produce. And so I just bring that up because I think that dooms this to building offshore wind where we're just going to waste half the energy it produces. And when I used to work for Wisconsin Public Service, they actually did a very effective energy conservation campaign that uh, prevented them from building another coal power plant. And I'm just curious why no one's really talking about energy conservation as a strategy to accomplish the same thing, which is meeting our energy needs. And so I'm kind of, if it fits into this process, I would really like a very strong recommendation of 
energy conservation campaigns as a solution to our energy needs. So that's yeah. all I have to say, really. Marcus, thanks for offering that. And if I could bug you to offer it one more time in just a little bit, because this next, after this section, we're going to get into like the outline of the roadmap components. And that includes like what's both in the roadmap, but like the intersections with the statewide energy strategy and other things that are going on. And so that the concept around energy conservation, making sure that's embedded in the outline appropriately is a great spot to bring that up again. Uh, Brees. Yeah, thanks. Um, kind of building on Mike's point, um, uh, in the effort of uh, proposing a solution or kind of um, an efficiency here, uh, we're going to hear a lot of popcorning of ideas and um, things that may be very far reaching or not. Um, maybe each, either collectively or by each working group, um, developing some prompt questions that help guide, you know, is it outside the parameters of what we are engaged with, um, not to steer uh, by any means, but, you know, we've already seen, um, we've had three pivots because of timing already. So every minute counts when we're engaged here. And if we can have a set of questions that help kind of, are we in this lane or not? Um, and it could be a very wide lane. I think that will help us um, in our respective responsibilities. Thanks. Yeah, Reese, thanks for that suggestion. And there was another one about kind of use of, of alternates. I think there's just a couple of things that we're going to request is part of this is because there isn't a huge amount of time before June. We really want round table members to be at every meeting. We know that may not be possible, but if we're going to get the kind of shared learning or the dialogue that you all know you want, like that consistency is super important. And of course we know folks have lives. So we'll play with, we'll play with that a little bit. Um, I think the second one, Reese, that we're probably gonna ask is for some homework in between those monthly meetings. And we just know that not everybody is able to do that. And the more, you, the more folks do that kind of in-between meeting work, the more the meetings are about sense-making and shared learning and less about orientation and context. And I think there was some pieces around surveys and stuff. We can use those in between meetings so that when we are together, and that's also why we're going like nine to five when we're together, like we'll feed you, we'll give you breaks, we'll give you time as humans. And like, we're going to spend some chunks together. All right, that triggered a whole bunch of hands just as I was getting ready to close it out. Um, so Anne and uh, Lauren and then Natalia, and if you don't mind, just keep it real tight so we can move to outline stuff. Hey there, Bobby, I'll do my best. I'm interested in figuring out how we actually get to the conversations that are not just about consensus, but are about con conflict. And I'm just wondering in this process, you know, I'm like not one who wants to go to conflict either, but it seems like when we focus only on the things where we can find agreement, then we never get to have the conversations about where there is disagreement and why and, you know, so anyway, just one, just wanted to throw that in to see how we think you're going to, how we're going to deal, if we're going to deal with that in this process, or if we're going to be focusing on solely the things where there's common ground. Yeah, Jeff, just thinking off the cuff here, we're going to have to go hard at trade-offs and spots where there's tensions and polarities, where you just can't have all of everything, right? And the sooner we can identify those and also be comfortable with not resolving them right away, I, I think we could probably tee those up, eh? I'm in. Okay. Uh, Lauren. I uh, just wanted to make a quick comment around energy conservation and that. I mean, obviously that is important, but Oregon has power shortages as is, and we'll only continue to see that grow as industry comes, especially with data centers and AI. Um, if we need to build power out and we need to make sure we're building out transmission at some point here, and Oregon has pretty clear 100% uh, clean energy goals outlined by House Bill 2021 by 2040. And if we continue to just sit on our hands and do nothing, I mean, the people who are suffering the most is my generation who are, you know, under 35 at this point. And I'd really like to see this 
um, have a constructive conversation about how we get to a clean energy economy in the future. Yeah, Lauren, I appreciate you offering that up. And Marcus, I saw your response in, in, the, in the chat. And, and I think this speaks to maybe one of the things you were just raising is, you know, there's going to be real important spots where we disagree and naming where that, that is as quickly as possible and then giving ourselves some structure to think about what does that mean for the roadmap is going to be important. Um, so we don't need to resolve all those those conflicts here today in the, in the process opening. But Natalia. And did I get your name right? Um, yeah, Natalia, it's yeah, great. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, I put in the chat, but also like, it's good to be clear from the beginning about organizational structure. So um, at least it would be good to have a list of people, which organization they represent with their email contact details. So we understand that we have state agency here, we have tribes, we have you know, like a university or whatever else. Um, this is from the beginning and that we clear understand who is in the round table, because let's say it's assumed like I was confused when we did breakout groups. Um, it seems like I'm on the round table, uh, but the same I'm representing agency. So where should I need to go or how you do those breakout groups? Um, so those uh, like clarity would be good. And in terms of, um, Date, dates for the future, um, it would be good for planning purposes, at least to have tentative schedule each month when we will have the round table. Because I like representing Department of State Land, I'm also involved in so many other working groups and even I need to travel sometimes. So um, it would be good, you know, for clarity to understand if I need to dedicate all day to travel somewhere. It's also related to the budget, how often, you know, they, the agency can allow me to travel. Uh, it would be good to have those tentative days, maybe at least for the next three months, so that we understand if people can attend those groups. So, yeah, just a little bit of clarity would be helpful from the beginning. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. And, and Jeff, I think our intent is to get out a, a roster of the, the Roadmap Roundtable members here in a bit. Um, and apologies, it's been very fluid. It's the composition of the roundtable was moving yesterday. Uh, and so we'll get those, we'll, we'll get that pinned down. But there are roundtable members, and then there are state and federal agencies that are kind of ex officio that participate as part of the, the roundtable, but are not roundtable members. And then within the roundtable, Anytime one of the federally recognized Oregon tribes, the nine tribes, would like to participate, that seat is always open. So we'll we'll get that clarified and, and rolled out. Thanks for your patience on that. Rick and then Ramfis. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to uh you know emphasize the point I forgot who break who brought it up that you know we need to create, make sure this is a space to talk about, you know, contentious you know, difficult subjects, um, you know, it's no secret, the tribes involved in ongoing litigation over this, you know, and, and part of, you know, the tribe's consideration about potentially dropping that litigation is, you know, this process, and, you know, in, and the hope and that this process will address the issues that BOAM was unwilling or unable to actually deal with, you know, what studies do we actually need, you know, if this was going to, if this is going to happen in Oregon, what mitigation measures do we actually need if this is going to happen in Oregon, what, what enforceable policies do we need, you know, and, and it's also uh, no secret, the tribe went from support of offshore wind, you know, to caution to opposition to litigation, and that's because there has not been a place where, you know, what we really need as coastal communities can be discussed. So I think, you know, our our hope as the tribe is that this is a place where those conversations can really happen. Thank you. Thank you for that, right? All right. Um, and then Ramfis, I'm going to give it to you for last word on, on this one. Um, and then 
I'm just noticing in chat and I have that similar love hate relationship with chat. It's such a great way for introverts and, and others to be able to participate. And we go sideways real fast when we start negotiating on, on chat, right? And we start having two parallel conversations. So just be mindful in, in chat as you're, as you're taking a look, please use that for feedback and, and questions. Um, and we'll just leave it, leave it open. And I think I saw that request Let's talk about how we want to use chat in the um, in the charter, and that could be something this group decides on. Ramfis. Yeah, no, thanks. I just want to plus one what you know Rick said, and you know, I hope you can also you know tackle some of the meaty topics. Um, I think even Anne pointed to you know I think I think it would be really important in a charter just to also have some like principles around like how we aim to sort of keep these conversations cordial or you know what's our responsibility with our words and our actions in this in this group because i think we're going to be presenting information from our perspective which is i think one you know very important but i think too it's really important that we're not trying to um you know uh, voice out other other perspectives and opinions um and i think that we're you know maintaining that we're all in it together not you know, necessarily against uh, one another. Uh, with that said, I think as we explore, um, you know, alternative scenarios, like I think it's really important that we, you know, make sure it's clear what the purpose of the roadmap is, which is on this case, you know, offshore winds. So I think, I think the alternatives will always be limitless, but I think I feel like the responsibility, like in an alternative scenario, things like I don't know, I'll just give you an example, like solar, for example, like, you know, that requires its own, you know, roadmap as well, like do, taking the responsibility here for other, other groups, other stakeholders, um, you know, and I think the state energy strategy, as you pointed out, Bobby, is like really important to remind folks that. So I think, you know, I think that, you know, I just don't want to, I just want to continue finding ways where we can realistically explore, get in the media conversations, explore alternatives, but I just want to recognize just the limitations of time that we have and you know just the purpose of this roadmap really keeps us tethered i think within the perspective of offshore winds i just want to kind of note that i think it'll be helpful to get to in, in a, a road an, a timeline that ends with the report by september um that does justice so um i'll quit blabbering but um yeah thanks you know when but your blabbering is really constructive Ramfis. So I actually, I really appreciate it. It's, um, you know, it's, no one wants to stop hearing when you all have really good stuff to say. Um, that said, hey, Ramfis and Julia, can I pick on you two to help us craft that, that charter? Um, and I don't know if there's one other volunteer that wanted to work with Sophia and I between, it's going to be between now and November 19th. So we'll sit together for like an hour um, or 90 minutes and, and craft it. Anybody want to join those those two with us? I'm happy to help, Bobby. Thanks, Casey. Karina, did you raise your hand too for that? And yeah, this I did, but help. only because in the absence of other volunteers. I'm happy to help if needed. All right, and then Rick, and, did you? And I'd be happy to do it too. Y'all are the best. Julia, Rick, Rick, Karina. All right, Sophia, there may have been some others and I may have missed it. So we'll go, but I think that gives us enough to schedule and we'll just do our best. All right, cool. Thank you all. That was great. Um, Jeff, and I apologize. We're running you three hours on a Zoom and that's intense. We're not giving you a break, but there's just, there's just a lot of things we wanted to touch on. So this is home stretch, y'all. So kind of dig dig deep into that reserve tank because um, this is, Marcus, this starts queuing up what you you led us to, which is, hey, here's an, a draft outline. What else needs do we need to be thinking about? So Jeff, I'll, I'll hand that to you. And if you could keep it pretty tight so we do have some time for breakouts on this, that'd be awesome. Got it. Okay. Um I'm going to be, as Bobby said, teeing up this next breakout, really. And the focus of the breakout is going to be uh, just a discussion level outline of what this roadmap could be. Uh, I, In the meeting materials that were attached with the agenda, if you look at the back of that document, there's like a two page, really high level outline that was developed for us to discuss together and 
and the paint. Um, so I'm going to just introduce what's in that, and then we'll go and talk. Uh, if you were in the information session, you've seen some of this already, but when I've been having conversations and thinking about the roadmap and looking at other state roadmaps, to me, I see it's like one of those ink pots where you can see so many different things in it. And, you know, I look at what this roadmap could have in it. And there are the things that House Bill 4080 said have to be in it. And that is standards that would be considered in future offshore wind uh, projects. But there are also all of these other things that are involved in if offshore wind happens, how does it happen right? And that could include key bargains that have to be struck and conversations to be had. We've heard a lot today about like the research and how we're managing the things we don't know about environmental risk. There's also this whole other side, which is what is the path to development? Like if we put on the hat of somebody who's trying to make this happen, what are the barriers that they are seeing? And as part of a roadmap, do we want to address those things? Um, bringing in the environmental protection standards do we talk about our permitting process? Do we talk about marine spatial planning? There are lots of different things is the point. Um, again, as we've also said a lot of times, you know, we've got 10 pounds to fit in a five pound bag with this process. We've got about, I think, eight full day meetings between now and June and some working groups and whatever we can squeeze in along the way to talk about a lot of stuff. And what I'm thinking about, how can we organize that conversation? One thing I'm loving out of today is like, maybe we just need to have the list of, of meaty topics too brought into this, but trying to think of how can we organize these conversations in themes? And so this is what I have come up with so far, and it's open for discussion that let's think about a future vision. Let's transport ourselves in the future and look back and talk about how we got to the future we want to see. Um, let's really focus on those environmental effects where we're talking about things like exit ramps and research agenda and adaptive management and what our policies are. Let's talk about people. Let's talk about the concerns that we have about those who may stand to lose, how communities might benefit, and what, what that might look like. And as I mentioned, what is the path to development and what are the opportunities and challenges? Let's talk about engagement and process, that if that's a recognized need in all of this, how, how can we structure that the right way? What role does the state have? Let's open that up. And then this last one, I think, is universal. And it comes from House Bill 4080, but it's also, again, our state's chance to sharpen our tools Let's keep an eye as we're talking about these other topics, always keeping an eye out for where, where might we have gaps that we can address through amending our policies. So with, with that as kind of our, our foci of our conversation, then how do we turn that into a roadmap itself? And the five basic buckets that I've come up with so far and that we're going to talk about. We need an introduction where we're talking about why we're doing this. And, and as Brees mentioned earlier, what is that compendium of information and assets that we already have to rely on that'll get us to a starting point? Let's talk about future scenario mapping and identify waypoints in our roadmap to help us understand the places we need to get to and in what order. Uh, this policy assessment, which is that heart that comes from House Bill 4080, you know, where are our gaps and how can we address them? There's this really broad category that is everything else on the ink blot, which is what are the strategic planning elements? What are the steps that we can take as a state or as communities or, as, you know, as the various ways in that we are to move this conversation forward? And then finally, what I think will emerge and hope will emerge from this process is an action plan. What are those short-term, medium, and long-term actions that we can identify out of this roadmap process that may carry forward into an implementation phase that comes after? 
So with all that said, I'm gonna show you what was on that piece of paper that's in the back of your agenda. And we're gonna have that as the backdrop for our breakouts as well. You'll see that they're on the whiteboards and you can mark them up as you see fit, make a total mess, it's fine. Uh, but as I mentioned, we've got that introduction and there, that's what I already described. Um, these alternative futures and how they fit into a roadmap. And we might find that they start coming together the more we talk about our, our future scenarios. I'd love to find a way to memorialize that. Um, the policy assessment and recommendations. What are the effects that we're concerned about by geography, by life cycle phase, bringing in what we heard from the considerations that came before this from that informal group? And then by the topic areas based on House Bill 4080. And once we've identified those effects that we're worried about and where those gaps might be, that's when we can have the conversation and bring into the roadmap what are the values, interests, information needs, and assets that we can bring to bear to address those gaps. And if this group comes up with specific policy recommendations, that's fantastic. And then talking through the the realities of how we could implement those recommendations. And this, this one is really open. And this is where I think your feedback is going to be really valuable in, you know, in the time that we have to develop this roadmap, what pieces that are kind of strategic in nature do we want to bring into the conversation and bring into the roadmap? And I put together a list just from the things that I've been hearing and they're in my head um, and I can elaborate on them um, as we get into our next conversation in our full day meeting, you know, what, what's being thought about there. And then again, that action plan. And that's, that's what I've got to get us started, Bobby. That was fast, but hopefully. Good. Yeah, that was, that was great, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so in, um, and I am going to ask for chat. It's getting too much for me to tr track at the moment. So if we can kibosh the, the chat for just a little bit, that'd be great. Um, but in chat, I did put the link into the meeting materials for today on page three is the outline. And so the two key questions we have as we get ready to send the roundtable members uh, to breakout groups is what's missing from the outline? What are some of those big chunks of information that's missing? Or what questions do you have? And the idea here is we want to give DLCD enough of an idea of what component parts are in there so that over the next few meetings, we can make sure that we talk about those component parts. That's the goal for today. So Andy, you feel unready to send folks out to breakouts? And again, moderators, if you can please uh, demonstrate kind of use of the um, the Zoom whiteboard so we can see if we want to continue using that. That'd be great. Andy, you feeling ready? I'm ready, Bobby. There will be some that I have to assign right after I open the rooms, but I will get to those as soon as I can. No problem. And we've got 20 minutes for, for this section. We'll bring you, we'll bring you back around 1120. All right. Opening the rooms now. All right, I'm going to head back out of this room and go do traffic control, Jeff. Thanks, Andy. Jeff, would you mind pulling up the outline that we're supposed to? OK, great. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Deep yeah. breaths here just real quick before we get started. How are we doing? Are we OK? This is a lot. Doing good. No, it, it's okay. it's a big question. It's a big process. So no, it's, all, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is your time and this is your space. And again, the questions are what's missing? What doesn't belong? What needs clarification? You know, you're welcome to come into the whiteboard link too and mess around. You know, it's not just me. We're in team six, um, but I will record anything you all want to talk about. Jeff, I have a question. In terms of in the introduction, the existing research and information relevant to the project, is has there been a, a list put together of the sources of, re, of, of references that we want to rely on for the process? You know, no, and it's always changing. 
you know, in the meeting materials, I included one that I saw just two weeks ago that was from Boehm describing, you know, the project design envelope. Um, you know, Oregon Department of Energy did a really great report back in 2021 related to challenges and opportunities. I know that Sea Grant and OSU have been working on a chapter for a legislative report that we're going to see in January that I think is excellent in terms of orienting us to like offshore wind for Oregon specifically. And I'm, I'm begging Karina to let me share it with you all. But so I guess point being, we need to build that. It doesn't exist yet, um, but I want to. I want to compile. So we can make recommendation. Please. Yeah. Um, for me, for one, for me, from my perspective, and I think it goes to the issue of why we're doing this in the first place. So my recommendation, as one of the sources, is that we use the um, the, in, the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the global, the U United Nations Global Organization on Climate. Uh, use their sixth assessment synthesis report summary for policymakers. And the reason why I recommend that source document, it's like 40 pages, is because it's the global scientific consensus on the latest research pertaining to climate science, which is the driver to why we're considering renewable energy in the first place. And it is, it, it, it reflects the unanimous point of view of all 195 member nations. As such, <laughs> I, I think it's the global, the, the most comprehensive document on what the globe scientists think on issues of climate science. And there's some very important data in there. And that could be then used as a launching pad, you know, because of course, in the full assessment reports, which are like 6,000 pages worth of reports, <laughs> There, you know, we can get into this much research on ocean science and the impact on whales with wind and all the other topics that are going to come up in our process. So it's just sort of a launching pad that represents global consensus. Okay. Thank you. Oh, good Lord. Yep. If I could jump in too, there's there's a pretty good uh, synopsis of uh, information or sources of information. There's the Tethys website and in that, there is the SEER um, program, the Synthesis and Environmental Effects Assessment on Offshore Wind. Um, there are a number of sources as well um, that have been, uh, I think that Tethys resource, that website is probably the most comprehensive, it's far more comprehensive than be able to need, but done a lot of work trying to pull those pieces together. So it's kind of the opposite from uh, Kevin's suggestion, starting at the top. This one is now looking at some of the most focused things, and there's going to be that balance. In between. Yeah, I, one of the topics that I want to talk about as a roundtable is what do we know about the state of the science and where do we go for trusted information? What is the state's process for bringing science into our decisions? And, you know, so that's a goal for these conversations that, you know, I'm thinking about when I think about this topic seven down here about environmental effects and, and how we deal with it, that part of that relates to our process for managing uh, you know, what we know and what we don't. I just want to say welcome, Melissa. I saw that you joined us. We are going over the outline draft for discussion of what a roadmap can have in it. And we're open to any thoughts people have. If I could also say that they um, now Humboldt Poly, um, uh, California Humboldt, uh, has their Shots Energy Center, and they've been developing um, reports for, they've got at least a dozen or that were specifically towards offshore wind for uh, Eureka. And it does apply strongly to Northern California, which is right where I live in, in Brookings. So it's right next door. They're a phenomenal resource. Also, Sea Grant is now at uh, Oregon State is now compiling the same sorts of things. So we're, we've got some really good resources that we could summarize that directing people to for that background. That notwithstanding, there's a lot of gaps that we want to fill. Susan, I see your hand raised. 
Yeah, thanks. I wasn't sure if I should raise my hand or just start speaking and I didn't want to talk over somebody. So um, thanks for this. One thing that uh, listening to, was it Kevin and Bill, you know, it looks like uh, we're looking at this like global look at environmental effects and climate change and then, you know, maybe nationally. Um, but we also might want to think about regional, <clears throat> you know, how, um, because the California current runs California to Washington up to, you know, BC and Alaska. Is there a way where we can look at things regionally that would, um, I, I don't know, um, I guess looking at climate effects regionally and also how offshore wind might benefit all the states or how we can work cooperatively. Um, not sure where I'm going with that in my head, but I keep thinking, um, as background, I'm part of the uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council and the Marine Planning Committee. And so we're trying to, the council is trying, is looking at some of these and asking the same questions, looking for the same data gaps and building on that. So if I can bring some of that information here, when we get that sorted out, um, that's a help too. So I, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, think, think about as we're, yeah, yeah, there are a lot of ways this roadmap could go and areas it could address. You know, I guess maybe we can go piece by piece. You know, we've had some good to make sure we're including in our introduction about existing research and information. Can I ask you, when I was describing the policy assessment piece of the roadmap, did that make sense? Did it seem like the right way to tackle what House Bill 4080 wants us to tackle, which is recommending standards? The idea being, let's start with effects. Let's figure out what policies we've got on the books to handle those effects. Let's see if there are any gaps. And then let's see what we want to do to address those gaps. But that's kind of the, the structure that I see of part three of, of that outline. Does that make sense? Do you have any alternative ways we should be thinking about this or organizing that? And Bill, I see your hand. Yep. I think it's consistent with the other roadmaps that you circulated as well. Um, Maine in particular, um, uh, Connecticut had a bit of that, New York had that. It sets the scene, sets the tone as to what the charge is. So I think that that's a, a good um, way of framing what is it that uh, we are working within, whether it's setting energy policy goals or goals for total amount of energy that could come from uh, offshore wind. The other hands, uh, I, I didn't notice um, military calling who was first. Go ahead, Melissa. Oh, you're, I can't hear you though. Oh, there you are. Okay. I was just going to say, I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, part of the, the challenge with this is going to be limiting it because we don't have the whole universe to explore and discuss. And so if the committee has a clear charge and a, and a way that we're approaching this, I think it's helpful for everyone. Thanks. Yeah, I was, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, I'm Carlin. I didn't get to introduce myself earlier. I work at Critfic in Wasco Palm, Yakima. And Critfic is the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. We uh, kind of focus on treaty and trust rights. Uh, and I, I'm here essentially with a focus on salmon. And I think that is a good strategy to have but I know when you discuss such in-depth uh, policies uh, with such large stakeholders, I would suggest um, some kind of outlet to ensure if we wanna get into the nitty gritty details, we have the opportunity to do that in some form. Um, and an example is siding. It, it's hard, you know, it goes into a lot of these categories 
and um, it's it'll it's just a lot of information I think that will be thrown, and I just want to ensure that we have avenue that if we want to do extreme detail and be involved, that we have an avenue to do that. Thanks. I'll say that we have put in our budget and our plan that we'll have some working groups, but we haven't decided what those are going to be. And I think that that's something that this group can help us to decide is what are those topics where we need to get down in the weeds and like have a set aside conversation with people who really care about it and want to get into it. Um, and we're going to try to decide what those groups are going to be in November and, and December. Are there any other thoughts about the part of the outline that is focused on that policy assessment piece? You know, again, gaps, what we, or excuse me, effects we care about, what we got on the books, where the gaps might be, and that's something that comes out of our conversation, and then where we've got a gap, what can we do about it? Whether that's a policy change or we get information or whatnot. And I heard people say, good. If there aren't any more comments on that, then I'd really like to focus on the strategic planning element piece, because that's the part that it could go so many different ways. I'm just curious what you all think belongs in a roadmap in addition to if the policy piece is the need to have and the rest of this is the nice to have, which ones of these would you say we absolutely need it? Are there any that you would say we don't need it? And are there any that are missing? Anna? Oh, you're, you're muted. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, is that better? I don't. Maybe I got put in the wrong group. I wasn't in your group before, but I'm here. So, um, hi, I'm with Bonneville Power Administration, um, and I cover Oregon governmental and legislative affairs. So, um, to me, what's missing in your outline is transmission. I don't see it in the document, and um, I want to make sure a note gets made because I think um, – there's definitely concerns about transmission and connectivity in the South Coast in particular, and um, also how you know any new transmission may or may not benefit the local communities. We've heard um, in the uh, community benefits subgroup, I think of one of the BOEM uh, processes that we're a part of, uh, people are concerned about community benefit from transmission. So there's a lot, I think, to dig in there. I think it would be important to include pieces of that here. And then also for the resources, um, there's a bunch of different West Coast transmission uh, work groups going on related to offshore wind. Uh, Bill, I think you're next. <laughs> Keep talking here. Um, I think that transmission is a real important part, and I think it fits back to, and I forget the individual's name that was a, um, uh, um, uh, is the architectural planning, I think it is. But it, it's, it's basically looking at the whole system, everything from what's going to be um, happening offshore all the way on to shore, and then the individuals that are going to be affected, the uh, way the energy will be used, it all fits together. Having an overall view is real important. And I am terrible on names, but I know that uh, University of Oregon has their architecture department, I believe it is, that is doing, has proposed to do that sort of work. I think cat tapping into work that's been done is important. And the reason that that's critically important is that you've had an opportunity to identify who would be affected in what ways so that no one ends up being left out. No one's being feel like they haven't been part of the discussion. So getting the whole overall uh, large view is going to be critically important. And that might be 
setting up at the uh, introduction, yeah. but then the individual parts are where it goes. Uh, and if I, Jeff, could in, indulge one more, but you had provided the uh, roadmaps from the East Coast. And what struck me is that the one that Maine had put together was comprehensive. It gave a lot of information. The one from Connecticut focused only on the human element, the um, jobs, the economy, the pro I think it was other things like that. It just barely touched on the resources, um, various other things that are critically important, have been a really big part of the discussion so far over the last five or six years here, five years. Got it. Um, I know you mentioned in the beginning travel engagement is going to be um, throughout the entirety, but um, question, why is it not included under the strategic planning elements? Yeah, good question. Um, so I see tribal interests existing so far in two places in the outline. One of them being that House Bill 4080 specifically requires us to include standards to be considered as they relate to tribal interests. And so tribal interests are going to be part of part three. Um, the, the state policy investment. Um, and this engagement, where did I have it? There was engagement expectation. Number 13, I see that as being a pretty broad category that could include engagement with public, engagement with local communities, engagement with tribes, that but that could be kind of a, a large section. But if we need to specify that tribal engagement gets its own piece, then I'm happy to make that clarification. I think that would be helpful just so tribes are confident that um, there's a very specific place for tribal input. Thank you. Okay, Susan? Sorry, I couldn't get my mouse to find the unmute button. So I had three questions, comments, I guess. Um, one, uh, will we talk about how offshore wind fits in with other renewable energies, you know, onshore and offshore, like like marine wave energy? Is there a place for that? Um, I'm not sure if that fits into one of the items under a strategic planning elements, but Hmm. Um, we may want to look at that more holistically if we are talking about climate. What is the best way to do renewable energy with the least adverse impacts to the environment? Um, maybe it's not offshore wind. Maybe it is. Maybe I, I just don't know. But that's one of the questions I think we need to ask. Um, okay. Second one was. Um, and I think this falls into number 16, alternative concepts, thinking just beyond turbines. Um, I think it's tough when we're talking about this because we're coming up against companies with ideas that turbines are the way or the only way right now, or, you know, but there are some innovative concepts that may have less effect on the environment may provide, may be able to get the same amount of power in a smaller space um, and have fewer conflicts with other user groups. Can Oregon have a say in that or, or, you know, or not? I don't know if it's a, you know, that's kind of bumping up against um, business entrepreneurship and um, yeah. capitalist inventing, but um, I just don't know. It'd be nice, I think, if we could. So are you talking if specifically there's a different kind of offshore wind design yes. that, that we could pick? Like, we'd prefer that kind and not that kind. Right, right. Different kind of technology or just at least look at them so that other people, you know, maybe elevate them so other people look at them too and say, gee, maybe this is better 
for Oregon. Um, maybe it's not. I, again, I just don't know, but there are some really quirky and maybe good designs out there. Um, I know Department of Energy has put a lot of money into innovative concepts for that too. So yeah. I don't know if there's a place for that. Well, I'll give you an example where it might have an effect <laughs> is if we had a visual resource standard that kind of led them to say it can't be too tall. Well, I saw a design out of China where they had it like a V shape and they put, you know, two turbines there and it's half the height. Yeah. Or the one where it's like a carousel that runs around with pipes. Yep. You know, and you're like, you know, could you through your policies kind of be the tail that wags the dog on that? Right. So, right. I, I, yeah, I hear you. Okay. Uh, Don? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think so. I'm for uh, context, I'm a biologist. And so the, the sort of element in this list of the strategic planning elements that I've been thinking about a bit more is that in number seven environmental effects, and especially those next two words that are listed there risk and uncertainty. And so, I mean, it's a bit, I'm just, thinking about the risk and uncertainty because a lot of, I mean, we don't have examples to look to for in the California current, what floating offshore wind platforms look like. Um, a lot of those designs that technology doesn't exist. We don't have examples of what it looks like yet and what how it will play out, particularly in this ecosystem. Also, we know that these are this is a dynamic ecosystem that is shifting with you know climate change with other impacts. And information is inherently challenged to gather in the ocean, especially on remote open coastlines like where we live. And so I, I think what where my mind goes with this and the strategic planning is that we are never going, we are, it will be very challenging to have complete information to where we don't have uncertainty and we know every piece of all of the risk. And so I think what we can hopefully focus some attention on is discussing what level of confidence of what level of certainty in the information do we need to have to feel like we can make recommendations or decisions in a way that all these different interest groups feel like the natural resources and the cultural resources off our coast here are going to be considered and the, that level of um sort of uncertainty or risk or confidence in what we know and don't know will probably be different for different topics, like for different species, for different, and for different research groups, what or um, sorry, for different interest groups, whether that is tribal communities or fishing communities or coastal residents. Um, so all of this is a bit long-winded, but to say that I think, I hope that something that we can think about is what amount of information do we need to be able to have a handle on risk and uncertainty to inform our decision making and have that those sort of thresholds for uncertainty guide how we prioritize um, information gathering moving forward so what do we need to fill those gaps yeah you're you're singing my song and then for the things that we if we decided we were going to move forward without perfect knowledge, how do we manage the stuff that we haven't answered yet? Can you exactly. manage it as you go? Do you have decision rules for yourself? That if we get surprised in this way, we know what we're going to do. And that we actually have an alternative that we can look to, you know, short of, or can it include, if we decide after 10, 20 years that there's an effect that we just can't live with, what are our options? Have we lost the opportunity for an exit ramp after a certain amount of time? These are all things I'm very curious to talk about with this group. Bill? That's that's why I really like the exit ramps that came in the um, study before from last June. Um, the other thing that I'm big on is cumulative impacts, and that has even less certainty. Um, one of the things that you have on number seven is adaptive management which means that we have to identify what are significant impacts. I'll leave it at that for Susan. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, why, you wanna, you wanna host us in Astoria?
<laughs> or somewhere up here, I uh, I can't do it. But we we can find a place or seaside, maybe that'd be great. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're we're open. We're just we're feeling really fortunate um, that folks at at the CT Clusi Tribe have offered to host us for the the first in person meeting, and it's it's just such a gift to have um, that support. All right, welcome back, everybody. How did that How did that go? Did that feel a a little a little less rushed? Still felt like you, you, okay, good. You got to get into it a little bit. Um, great. Well, let's just do a, a report out. I think Andy, maybe you and I can start maybe a, a little bit of the chit chat we were having with our members from the the public. Um, and I think some of the feedback that we got was, well, oh, shoot, why didn't we just assign the public to breakouts to be observers? Like that would have been a lot easier and given a, a viewpoint into what was going on in the breakout session. So we heard that. Um, we also uh, heard kind of, hey, can't we just make the agendas really clear where the where the opportunities for full group conversation are versus breakout conversation? So we heard that too. So just wanted to let you know we, uh, that was some of the conversation that was happening here on the home base while breakouts were happening. Um, Sophia, do you want to start with your group and feel free to invite any of your your breakout folks in? Um, but what were some of the kind of high themes? Um, was there kind of a common theme or was there anything surprising that came out for you? Uh, thank you, Bobby. I think uh, we have a good conversation about what the things that probably all the members of my small group uh, find that they they are missing and uh, some of that and also some questions. So we were talking about the uh, what will be the alternative scenarios so, and trying to define how we would like to map map these scenarios. Please, I invite any any of the members of the our small group to to help me explaining as well that if you would like to uh so we were like saying that for example how we define what ocean areas will be off limits so how we get it to the minimal areas to the maximum kind of scenarios where we would like to see um this development happening so we were talking about also labor standards and community benefits as a whole that is missing in the outline so we would like to see that uh, that was something that our members of my small group identified that is missing. Uh, the proposal of exit ramps as well is not only about the environmental uh, part, but also about the community and the social issues that those should be also um, considered um, into the exit ramps uh, uh, point. And that is a connection with one of the questions is like, how do we engage local communities? into this process, like how we do the process of making this an inclusive uh, conversation with local communities. Um, uh, we talk about uh, the coastal energy resilience and the unintended consequences and impacts. Um, what else? I don't know. I invite members of my group if you would like to add something else. And we have plenty of sticky notes uh, and I invite them to continue putting many stickies as they want later on since this is going to be open for them to continue doing so. Nice, thanks Sophia. Any, anybody else from Sophia's team? Scott and Nate. Yeah, I just say you uh, you, you covered, I feel like everything that we discussed, discussed in our short, short period of time, lots of topics, but uh, I think we made really good use of the time that we had. Great. Thanks, Nate. And this won't be the the last last chance to to take a look at those. So, um, how about uh, Jeff? What'd your team come up with? And as I as I call on our moderators, feel free to just hand it right over if there was someone that said I wanted to report out. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, we were the group six, and we we started off warming up talking about what is the existing research and information, and I was getting some really good ideas of places we need to make sure we're looking and those are probably also going to be information sources we need to bring into this group to to feed us as well as feed the roadmap um i think generally 
people were on board with the structure of the policy assessment piece. And that might've benefited from me being in the room to say, we wanna talk about effects. We want to then figure out what we've got on the books already that addresses those, identify the gaps. And then where we identify gaps, we talk about what we wanna do about them. That generally that seemed like the right structure for that conversation in part three. Uh, and then when we got to part four, talking about the strategic planning element, one of the early observations is that the transmission piece of this and the connectivity is part and parcel of an offshore wind roadmap that, that the transmission itself that's required to connect offshore wind to the grid may or may not have benefits or effects for local communities that need to be brought in. Um, and that that's a piece of it. Um, some references to looking at the whole system again from offshore to onshore, how the energy will be used. Um, there is a clarification requested that tribal engagement have its own place in the roadmap rather than be within the general category of engagement expectations. And so can make that change. Um, there was talk about how offshore wind might fit in with other renewable energies like wave energy. So thinking about like ocean specific interconnections there and what extent Oregon can we be can we have a specific preference on different types of offshore wind turbine designs that might be out there if there are some that are shorter versus taller versus different designs entirely are there ways in which we can have a direct effect on that and then we had a good conversation about the environmental effect piece talking about um that we don't really know how these projects have a play on the ecosystem and that the ecosystem itself is shifting. Information is challenging to gather. And this recognition that there is uncertainty and we need to define for ourselves, what is that threshold of how much uncertainty we can live with and still make a decision versus not? And then what do we do about what's left behind? Those things that we don't know. And that includes things like cumulative impacts and, and adaptive management. Cool. we will stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, how about your group, Lisa? Uh, well, a little, some of, I'm hearing some recurring themes, uh, certainly running through it. We also spent some time talking about the regional aspect of energy and wanting a place for that with California and Washington talking not just about environmental uh, impacts, uh, but also supply chain, workforce, all of those pieces that, that have a regional inc and usage, you know, how that affects. Uh, we did have some conversation around um, tribal, um, tribal interests and how they're engaged in this. And we, we talked a little bit about what our process is as we've talked about it and so, uh, I think there's a number of different ways that we can approach that. Um, we also talked about um, understanding the costs of actual, the actual cost of it, you know, so as a consumer of energy, what what is that cost to me? You know, how, what is the cost to the developer to actually get this up and running? Have we established certainty across the landscape for everybody to know, you know, how, what what the state is looking for, what they need to provide, what the user needs. So there's a lot of interest in that aspect of it. There are a lot of other processes going around around energy, and we want to make sure we're integrated into those. And uh, it was brought up that maybe the energy strategy that Odo's putting forward needs to, whether it's a chapter or just a learning opportunity, we all need to understand what's happening there and how we fit in the bigger picture. Um, there was some acknowledgement that the legislature, you know, was focused on offshore wind, but there are other marine renewable energy opportunities, which has been brought up, but then just the general energy landscape and how this all fits in so that we're not working in a silo, come up with great recommendations only to have one policy or some other strategy, kibosh it, and why do we waste our time? So making sure we're really tied in. Uh, there was... There were a lot of great comments, and I think I captured all of them. But uh, it was a, it was a, it was good. It was really good. Right on. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Hui, what'd your, uh, what'd your group come up with? 
Uh, we went sort of the other direction. We were talking about um, vision and goals and you know measurable outcomes. And so uh, some of the things we talked about was um, what was the directive from House Bill 4080 that we need to accomplish. And so we need to, so we all have you know, different ideas of what you know vision is from this process, um, but we may need to establish what that is um, in our document. Um, and we also talked about, um, as far as we talk about, um, we, so one of the feedback was also that if we could have um, time to actually think about these more, say maybe provided it in the, um, before the meeting, um, just because trying to do the whiteboard and, and answer these questions at the same time was really hard. Um, we were, so we spent probably half the time trying to figure out the whiteboard thing. Um, and anyone from the group, please, if I miss anything, please jump in. Uh, but that's so we just spent a lot of time trying to figure out the whiteboard. Yeah, I, I, I just want to jump in real quick and say, Thank yeah, you. we spent a lot of time trying to understand the technology, which is like, this is what happens in the first meetings where you're doing something you've never done before. And it was, so it was a lot of time trying to understand the technology and we just cleaned in. Um, but there was a suggestion that um, maybe the input we were, you, and you just said at the beginning of this too, Bobby, that this is like, we're going to be able to come back to these ideas. This isn't like the first and last time we're going to think about them. But I, I think this is a really ripe um, opportunity for like that survey suggestion of, you know, asking people to provide their thoughtful written thoughts on it um, that could help guide a conversation in the future. Because sometimes it's like, you're, like it's hard to think of these things on the fly in a breakout group with people you're just getting to know. So um, it might be a good survey opportunity between meetings. Oh, I'm sorry. And one other, uh, substantively, um, I think we collectively really understood that individuals in this space might um, definitely, not even might, definitely have different goals and outcomes that they're maybe um, seeking. Um, but 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 figuring out what that kind of common vision is that really is process oriented um, is something where we feel like there's probably a really high level of consensus about figuring out how how we want to get where we're going and understanding that that it's that what a good process will lead to is is that common understanding you know if we aren't always each of us 100% in agreement on goals and outcomes by the time we get to the end of this process, a goal would be for people to have like a collective understanding of how we got here and why we're here and being able to be like as okay as possible with those, with those, with those outcomes. That that's um that's not a fully articulated goal, but that was something that people were kind of like head nodding to as we were talking. Thanks, Joy. Um Ava, what'd your group come up with? Thank you. Uh we were breakout group five. And we discussed a few different things. One was building trust in the process. Uh, so how do we build trust as a round table and uh, as as community members? Um, and how, you know, if, if there isn't sort of trust in the process, it'll be harder to participate in, in a more honest way. And, and sometimes coming into a process um, feeling like you won't be involved, like your vo voice won't be heard in the long run or ongoing, um, then it's, it's you know, we tend to participate in a more conservative way. Um, so we talked about just the importance of, of starting out with trust. Um, we also discussed sort of an intro or a preamble to the, to the, out, uh, to, to the document outline that would discuss climate change and uh, consideration for future generations and particularly the seventh generation. Um, we talked about the importance of defining what we mean by green energy and clean energy, um, and as well as uh, discussing alternatives to offshore wind, as well, including wave energy. Um, and I think sort of outlining why, why wind is important, um, particularly in the beginning. Um, and then lastly, we discussed mapping for future scenarios. So what are the thresholds and uh, going forward in the future in which we will revisit this discussion or revisit alternative options? Um, and, you know, just sort of acknowledging that the world will look different going forward. And so how can we kind of outline and plan for that in this document? And please, if anyone uh, has anything else to add from, from group five, please chime in. 
Uh, this is Rian Vies. Um, just want to make a quick suggestion on the, you know, I think on the kind of the sub areas to explore, I just kind of wanted to provide a friendly suggestion of reframing um, the exploration of benefit agreements to uh, legally enforceable agreements. Because I think for many, there's a presumption that benefit agreements are cash payouts or just in, in presuming that there's a benefit um, where I think legally enforceable agreements may be more welcoming and thinking about um, agreements that could mitigate uh, or ensure oversight and accountability um, for development projects. So I just want to sort of offer that just sort of reframing. So when folks come in, they're thinking about the full universe rather than thinking, oh, this is just a, you know, cash payout or the, this necessarily presumes it's a positive project. So I just wanted to offer that friendly suggestion. Yeah, Rick. What, one of the other points I raised is, is does this group create, will there be space and opportunity to identify areas that we might agree should, should be excluded and areas that there might be agreement would be okay for offshore wind development. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Yeah, all all of what Ramfis and Rick just said, but but also the discussion of not just building trust at the beginning, but part of the building trust is empowering folks on an ongoing basis. So when we have those legally enforceable agreements, folks know that it's not just there's this snapshot here where your voice may be heard or you have an option but it is you have an ongoing seat of power at the table in making decisions and having that enforceability moving forward. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Cynthia, what'd your group come up with? Um, thank you, uh, Bobby. I was in group one, so anybody can chime in. Um, I'm just gonna do some highlights. They may not be in any specific order, but like, uh, a lot of what was said is was mirrored in other groups. Um, but some of the highlights were to to kind of define kind of um, what was said by Rick is, you know, what parts of the coast shouldn't be developed and what areas can be developed, but what are their parameters um, and, and all the areas in between um, and have a process that has tangible outcome. Um, also looking at opportunity of transparency across all entities, um, maybe ensuring publication of maps and reports um, and more coordination with sharing this information would be uh, would be good. Um, and then have the document address all the roles and the views of the state. Um, and then suggesting looking at the group that met prior to this, uh, Bobby, you were part of that, um, and the information that was shared there. Uh, also looking at the development of a marine spatial planning program that would not only look at the federal waters, but the state waters. Um, there was concern uh, about uh, the responsibility of the developer to the local community in the event of, say, a natural disaster or some other catastrophic event, which also brought in the conversation of community benefit agreements and their importance. Uh, uh, like another group had mentioned, you know, have, put Oregon in the driver's seat when it comes to design standards, um, evaluation and determinations, and um, have Oregon participate in other parts of that. Um, and then uh, strategic planning is to make sure we consider all aspects, um, uh, I think, which is, is identified there. And then uh, another concern is that we make sure as much as we'd like to have the energy come back to the Oregon coast, all of it, uh, it may not. So to bolster our planning to ensure that the coastal communities receive energy um, that is generated off their shores. And right. if anybody else wants to speak up, they can. Anybody from Cynthia's group? Moderators, did I did I miss anybody? I, I think again, just really reiterating the the benefit of a community benefit agreement for those communities most affected, and ensuring that those folks are getting what they need out of the development of offshore wind, if that does come. Great, thanks, Lauren. I will mention we also, it was a little challenging working on that whiteboard um, because it was, 
yeah, so we, I ended up just taking notes on my PDF and I'll just paste those into the whiteboard for later. Yes, so for moderators, let's let's debrief real quick after this um, because we're gonna wanna take snapshots and we're just, we're gonna need a, a way to make sure if we break out in small groups, we get notes. So we'll, we'll adjust on that, but thanks for your patience and experimenting with it. All righty. Um, so Andy and Cynthia, how we how we looking at public comments so far? And if you're think, interested in providing a public comment, please go ahead and just let us know in chat that you're interested. Okay, so we have first up uh, Will Isaacson, followed by Heather Mann. Okay, I'm not going to open public comment just yet, but just yep. curious how many we have. Um, so as that's I get all there, we have. Okay, I thought I saw Christopher Hall on there too, but we'll we'll check. Um, the uh, oh, before yeah. I open for public comment, um, do stick around. Um, one because it's really important to be listening to what members of the public have to say, and it's going to inform our our roundtable work. Um, and two, uh, we're going to do a closing and kind of next steps. Um, and for our our staff team, if you could do me a favor. And just think through the various action items that have come up over the course of uh, today um, and just make sure we can uh, um, capture those as we as we close out today. All right, so for public comment, um, please just try and be brief. We're going to try and keep bonus points if it's about a minute, but we're going to keep folks under two minutes if possible. Um, but really, we want to hear what you have to say. As you're talking, just keep in mind just the, our general ground rules, um, which is, you know, assume good intentions on what you're what you're hearing, but be mindful of the impact your your words are are having. And that's that's all we really ask. Um, and we'll take these public comments in, and then we'll incorporate those with everything else that we're getting as as feedback. So with that, William, tell us what's on your mind. Thank you. Um, I think, first of all, let me say that, that in any energy consideration, there are hidden areas that uh, nobody really thinks about, you know, like, for example, in steam, um, you, you see the plumes of steam and they're pretty innocuous, but there's a hotter steam that's called live steam and it's, it's a greenhouse gas and, and federal legislation doesn't consider steam at all in, in any of their greenhouse gas things. So I want to make sure that something's considered here. That uh, that's why I came to find out, and I think Jeff answered part of the problem, part of the answer to that. Um, there's a difference between um, five five windmills and five thousand windmills, and that's the size of the effect that it has. Um, if you have uh, energy taken out of wind, it means the wind slows down. Uh, if you have two or three windmills, it's nothing. If you have a whole bunch of them, then it might be something. Um, and and I I come at this from uh, some studies that were done 50 years ago at Stanford Research Institute, and I found it on the back of this uh, of the uh, scratch paper. Um, there was an attempt to do some offshore energy uh, that would have, if done, would have turned California into a, a desert. Uh, it's because it changed the weather. And so I want to make sure that that consideration is done before any windmills are built, you know, and I just would like to say that. So I think that pretty much covers the thing. Um, we have somebody else that's working on the birds. I see that's good. Um, other than that, we move on to the next person. William, thank you very much. That was that was great. Um, and uh, right at a minute, minute 30. So I think uh, Christopher Hall and then uh, Heather Mann after after Christopher. Christopher, go for it. Oh, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes, you sound great. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, my name's Christopher Hall, I'm with Water League. Um, my, my interest was on the discussion about the degrees or diversity of agreeableness versus the consensus that would be had among our team members and how that might reveal an important bias regarding whether the question of the RT is either creating a roadmap or whether it's gathering a fountain of ideas. 
Since the DLCD views the RT as an advisory group without authority, then it seems like the fountain of ideas appears to be the emphasis. However, the bias in favor of consensus counteracts the fountain of ideas. In this context of a fountain of ideas, consensus may be restrictive because it tends to overwhelm diversity and inclusion. If the RT's purpose was to create a roadmap, then the concept of a funnel would be necessary to make decisions. However, the RT's mandate is only to advise without authority and not make any decisions. Um, the funneling process feels counterintuitive to the advisory nature, and it may risk the possibility of crossing over from forging consensus to manufacturing consent. There is, a generally, there is generally a bias that consensus is always good, but I think that that's a fallacy. In fact, most people, many people do. Throughout history, consensus has had many horrific results as it, has, as, as it has many wonderful results. Maybe it's had better results, but there's a mix. And when a group is the entirety of those who are affected by their own decisions, then there is a much higher chance that consensus is preferable and fair. But when a group is advising on issues that affect others not in that group, consensus can lead to estranging important minority ideas that others not present might feel like they wish to support. The RT has been convened ostensibly to reflect a much bigger set of citizens. And so I think it ought to consider the nature of how it manages the minority ideas it has beyond just funneling to a consensus among the majority of its members. Thank you so much for the time to share these thoughts and um, I appreciate you all. I appreciate you all being here and, and, and the work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Heather Mann. Uh, thanks, Bobby. Uh, my name, for people who don't know me, is Heather Mann. I'm the executive director of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. I'm based uh, in Newport, Oregon. I also was one of the co-hosts of the informal um, task force that met um, together with Ramp Fees and Nicole Hughes from Renewable Northwest. Um, my comments are sort of big picture, and I think um, something I hope uh, people will think about as they move forward. Um, and it's sort of what are the trade-offs? You know, what what is the tipping point? Um, if you're promoting the development of offshore wind because we have mandates and because we have increasing needs for energy um, and we're going to move forward even with unknowns, what are when what's the tipping point? When is the level of impacts to um, tribal concerns acceptable. Um, for example, um, when is the impacts to food security and sustainable seafood acceptable? So uh, uh, the example I'll use is if we um, had moved forward with the lease auctions, um, I can tell you that millions of pounds of sustainable seafood have been harvested out of the areas that were being considered for leasing. Um, that harvest is distributed, you know, regionally, locally, nationally. Um, and a good portion of Oregon's sustainable seafood actually goes into the national um, food lunch program. So we're feeding um, kids all around the nation who don't have access otherwise to, to healthy food and they're eating, you know, Oregon seafood at lunch, including, you know, schools in Oregon. If that is impacted, is that an acceptable outcome? And I know those are, these are hard, large questions, but I want people to be thinking about beyond just, um, just what's right in front of us, thinking about the secondary and tertiary impacts because we have a lot of competing executive um a lot of a competing executive orders i would say and bobby's telling me to, to cut it off so um that's just what i would hope people will think about uh is the the tertiary the secondary and tertiary impacts and what is what is your level of of uh, tolerance for impacts thanks thank you heather <clears throat> it 
Andy, is there anybody anybody else who's who's popped up on the list? Yeah, Mike Okoneski. Go for it, Mike. Good morning. Right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, we, we can, can, Mike. Okay, just real quickly, I've been in the seafood business for 55 years now, and primarily in running fish plants and sales. Um, retired at this point, but still involved in the council process, Pacific Fishery Management Council is three advisory panels, uh, one of them being marine spatial planning. And I've been around offshore wind development on the East Coast and West Coast for the last six and a half years and involved. Uh, mine is pretty short, I believe. There's a, uh, for those of you that do, do not know, there's been a, in Washington, a group that was hired by the governor all grid works. They put out a pretty good report that I think would be beneficial to read. And in particular, they've got, uh, I think it's 53 data gaps that they uh, got together after uh, in interviewing a lot of people. And that's on page six, uh, second recommendation, but it's easy to get to, or we could send it out to everybody, but uh, they're, they followed somewhat of, I think, a parallel course, although it went a little different route with a consulting firm. And I think they did put together a really uh, unbiased uh, report that's worth looking at. The other one is just real short. I've asked this before. I'd really like to know a little more definitively where these jobs are going to pop up that they keep talking about um, because there's three major projects going on right now to manufacture and uh, assemble these wind turbines, uh, one in Los Angeles, one in Puget Sound, and also in Humboldt Bay. So whatever is going to happen in Oregon, I, we're just curious about uh, some of us about how, where that's going to happen and who it might involve. I mean, it'd be really disappointing if we found out it didn't occur after all this. So, um, and that's not too much to ask, I would think. So thank you, that's it. Appreciate it, Mike. And Andy, I'm gonna circle back around to you one more time here in just a second to see if we have anybody else for public comment. If you're interested, go ahead and, and let Andy know in chat. But I just also wanna acknowledge that online and via the Google form, we heard from Rick Osborne, uh, Lynn Coker, uh, John Perona, um, Mike Okaniski, and Christopher Hall as well. So just letting you all know we've we've received those already. No one else has entered the queue, Bobby. All right. Well, with that, let's go ahead and uh, close public comment. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, would you mind just Flip into the next slide for kind of next steps and where do we go? Perfect. So we really hope you all join us uh, November 19th uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Three Rivers Casino in, in Florence. Again, thank you to our, our hosts from CT Clusi Tribe for helping arrange that space. Um, there will be a hybrid option available if you want to join via Zoom, but just like at the the top of the meeting, if you can be there in person, we really, really would appreciate that. Um, it's uh, it's going to make the dynamic a, a lot easier, but that's not always possible. So we'll make sure you can participate virtually too. Um, we're going to aim uh, for materials for all meetings to get out about seven, uh, seven days in advance. Uh, the question for registering for the hybrid option, Jeff, I assume we'll just have another registration link that goes out for November 19th, correct? Yeah, and I'll put a plug in here that if you were to go to the DLCD Offshore Wind Roadmap page, you'll see a link to sign up for email notifications about all things related to offshore wind and the roadmap. If you haven't done that yet and you want to be notified when these things are happening, that's a good way to just make sure you don't miss stuff's coming through perfect if someone from dlcd can go ahead and drop that that link into uh into chat again that would be great yeah on it. yeah you're the best um there is gonna be uh next slide 
We are going to ask a little bit of homework coming out of this meeting. Um, you all suggested some of that too. <clears throat> so, and Jeff, uh, Jeff framed this up so nicely the other day. Um, it's like, if you're out walking your dog, your kid, your cat, yourself um, with 15 or 20 minutes, and you just kind of go 30 years into the future, and you look back at what the coastline looks like, um, relative to offshore wind, what happened? Like, what did you all as a, a group do between now and the future that responsibly includes offshore wind? What questions did we answer before moving forward? What protections did we have in place? So that's a kind of a thinking homework assignment in advance of November 19th. Um, Jeff, I think we got a request kind of for that kind of survey concept of sending that out. So. There's both what information needs do you have, a review of the draft roadmap outline, tell us what's missing. But I heard people also request a little bit more time for what their vision of success might be. Um, and then there might have been a, a, a couple others that came out of the small groups that we want to try and include in the survey. November 8th is not very far away. So we'll try and, and flip that around to you just as humanly fast as humanly possible. And we know that's a fast turnaround, but when we get that information on the 8th, that gives us about two days to turn it around to you and get it out one week in advance of the 19th. So this is gonna be one of those things where we're meeting for full days every month, but just turning the corner is gonna be a little tricky. So um, we're gonna also with that next communication out is do some scheduling. So hopefully between now and June, we're scheduling every single monthly meeting so we can all plan for that prep work and follow up work and just kind of get into as much of a rhythm as possible. So watch for those. And our ask is, it's just bonus points for how quickly you respond. Um, one of the things our takes our team a ton of time to do is chase people. So uh, if you can be responsive, that's super helpful. What other action items? Oh, we have an action item to kind of revisit how we engage with the public when we do breakouts. So that's on our team to think about. We also have an action item to look at the tech we're gonna use during breakouts to capture notes during, during hybrid. Team, what are the other kind of key action items we wanna lift up for folks as we close the meeting? Uh, I captured looking into a library of resources mm -hmm. for people to yep. have a shared base. And then along those lines, also distributing the roster for the round table. Sophia, anything, anything that you caught in the notes that we didn't lift up? Mm, uh, I don't think so, Bobby. I think you listed all the next action items that we will have to okay. share with the whole group. So thank you. DLCD team, any anything on your mind? Okay. All right. And we will be getting in touch with the volunteers that will help us drafting the charter document. Correct. That's one of our action items. Yeah. So we'll get in. Uh, so that was Rick and Ranfees and Julia. Karina. Casey. Thank you so much for volunteering. Yeah. Oh. Um. Jeff, any how you feeling? Like what's any what reflection do you have in just a, a quick quick 30 seconds on kind of how today went before we formally close? Yeah. Uh boy, I I feel a lot of gratitude. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with the conversation that's been had. I know there are a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions too. There's a there's a lot that we've got to do. Um, and we're gonna really try our best here. And just thank you. Thank you for coming, for giving your time, for bringing your ideas, helping us construct this together and try to find our best path. So thanks. Well, with that, happy Dia de los Muertos, beginning of Native American Heritage Month and all the other things that you celebrate. Um, be well. We look forward to seeing you not just the 19th, but every month from here to June. Um, if you have any kind of closing thoughts or reflections, you can feel free to offer those in chat on your way out. Otherwise, we'll hear from you really soon. 
And DLCD team, if you were a moderator, if you want to stick around, we'll just debrief real quick, maybe in, in this room as we close out. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye. All right, Jeff, I think we can stop the recording whenever you're ready.